One day, Duke Blanche's daughter, the lovely Lariat, felt strange. She had some strange sensations. The girl was worried about her health. Secretly from everyone, she decided to visit the doctor. There, Lariat unexpectedly learns that she is sick and that unfortunately this disease is incurable. According to the doctors, she has only a few months to live. The girl was shocked and very frightened. This tragic news was like a thunderbolt. It knocked her out of her routine and shocked her. All her dreams, wishes, and plans were useless and unattainable. Lariette became angry. She was angry at the whole world. Why did I have to do this? Why? What have I done wrong? The girl cried out of grief, hopelessness, the irreparability of what had happened. Having poured out the first acute and desperate emotions, the girl went home with her head bowed. Faced with the inevitability of her imminent death, she was depressed, sad, and dark. The white light was not kind to her. The doctors gave her only three months to live. How little, how little. She could not accept this terrible news. But in the midst of her sad reflections, she gradually began to crystallize an idea of what she should do next. It was a sudden crazy thought. Bend down. If I have so little time left to live, why don't I live the hours and months I've left the way I want to? It should be said that Lariat's relationship with her family was not the best. Her father, the fifth Duke of Blanche, had managed to maintain his status only because of his family's participation in the founding of the country. But now things were going badly for him. So he decided to improve his fortune by marrying his daughter to the old but rich Marquis of Segrev. The girl's mother, Duchess Blanche, married the Duke only because of the noble position of his family and was in full agreement with her husband in everything. The favorite of the family was Rand Blanche's elder brother. His parents were always glad to see him, were friendly to him, supported him, and indulged him in everything. As an heir, he attended lessons for the successors and classes in magic. The entire family fortune was passed on to him. Lariette, on the other hand, received neither education nor wealth. Her parents paid little attention to the girl's education. She was trained only in office work so that she could be an assistant to Rand Blanche. Her brother often abused her, demanded unquestioning obedience to the heir's orders, was intemperate, rude, unfair. On the day when the girl learned of the irreparable misfortune that had befallen her, Ryan, who was at the table, once again allowed himself to abuse his sister. He poured a glass of wine on her head in front of her father and mother, but even that was not enough. He immediately demanded that she be thrown out of the table, or he would refuse to eat as long as that disgusting girl was there, as he thought. Lariette was offended and humiliated. She was very bitter and resentful. The parents did not protect the poor girl. Instead of pulling the rude man down when she saw his abuse of her sister, her mother only pulled the girl down herself, reproached her for getting on her brother's nerves, and told her to go to her room and clean herself up. As usual, they supported Rayan, the heir. Once again, the girl felt lonely and unwanted in her family. Lariette had no choice but to leave the table, which made Rayon very happy. Once again, he enjoyed his sister's humiliation and his victory. As she left, the girl thought bitterly, I will die in three months and no one will care. This made her even more determined. I don't want to live like this anymore, and I don't want to die according to the rules of this house. Why should I be afraid if I'm going to die soon? So why shouldn't I live the remaining three months the way I want to live? Back in her room, having cleaned up and calmed down a bit, Lariette began to think, what do I want? Thoughts swirled in her head. I want to give Anne, my faithful servant and assistant, a cake. I want to be independent. I want to break off my engagement to the Marquis of Segrev, with politeness and courtesy, of course, she specified. I really want to take a trip to the West. Round had always talked so much about it, she thought. I also want to meet a beautiful stranger, Lariette thought, gazing dreamily into the distance. In her dreams, she drew her future beloved and how they would have everything wonderful even if she only had three months left. Yes, she stirred, coming out of her reverie. I have nothing to lose. All these years, my family has only used me. So at least now, even if it's just for a little while, I can live my own life. Yes, that's what I want. The very next day, Lariette fulfilled her first wish. She bought a cake for Anne, and then the two of them went for a walk in a carriage, while our heroine wanted to visit the Marquis de Segrev and say goodbye to him politely. Thus, the young, beautiful daughter of the Duke Blanche hurried towards the realization of her crazy desires in reality. The girl was excited by the adventures that awaited her, a little afraid of the unknown, but it was her decision, and she did as she wished. Suddenly, the carriage shook violently. The girls nearly fell off their seats. There was a loud cracking sound. It turned out that the wheel of the carriage had hit a hole. The coachman reassured them that he would fix everything and try to pull out the flat tire. It was then that the girls noticed a carriage coming toward them. It turned out to be Duke Kendall's carriage. Anne thoughtfully asked Lariat not to get out of the carriage. 
Why, she asked herself. Because you are engaged. You have a reputation to protect. Duke Kendall? Who's that? Lariat asked. This family has the most influence in the entire empire. Their duke is called a monster, Anne told her. A slim, tall, statuesque man dressed all in black approached their carriage. He effortlessly lifted the carriage with one hand and helped to free the wheel from the hole. His face was covered with a bandage, and only his beautiful blue eyes were visible. These eyes reminded Lariette of something, but she could not immediately tell what or who it was. Wow, the girls marveled. This family even has a cunning coachman. Thank you, coachman, they shouted together. The man in black walked away silently. The obstacle to their journey had been removed. Their carriage moved on. After returning from her walk, Lariette spent the whole day thinking about how to fulfill her wish to leave her unloved fiancé. She expected him to be at home resting. But the Marquis de Segrève was suddenly at her side. Larry, how many years? How many winters? How glad I am to see you, exclaimed the Marquis. He kissed her hand and looked at her carnally. Where do you always disappear? Segrève held her tightly in his arms. When we are finally married, I will not let you out of bed, he declared. The girl was hurt and uncomfortable. She thought it was time to fulfill the third item on her list, to politely break off the engagement. The Marquis admired her beauty and took her in his arms, but at the same time he complained that the price of the goods was too high. He alluded to his wealth and to the fact that in order to get such a young beauty, he would have to share the wealth with Blanche's family. And at the same time, he pressed her greedily to him and reached for her lips. I couldn't stand it any longer. It's over. Tonight, right now, I'm going to get rid of that nasty old man. And perhaps without any politeness, Lariette decided. She pushed the unhappy fiancé away sharply. Go away, she said as if she were a nail. The girl felt a great relief at being able to do this deed. That's it, I'm free. It must be said that the young and beautiful Lariette, who is the subject of our story today, is a representative of the Blanche clan, famous for its outstanding magicians. But it is she, Lariette Blanche, who will eventually dominate this era. In the meantime, let's learn more about her. Despite the fact that the girl was born with a magical gift, Lariette has not received proper training. The reason for this was that her parents paid all their attention to the education of her older brother, Rayan. Despite the fact that he already had all the advantages, as he had the hereditary right to become the head of the Blanche family, Rayon was very jealous of her talent and did not like her. Four. Nevertheless, the girl learned the wisdom of magic by watching from the sidelines. Besides, the magic teacher thought it was a pity to leave such a talent unattended. Seeing her desire and diligence, he sometimes taught her some secret knowledge. In the last chapter, we parted from Lariette when she abandoned her planned politeness and courtesy and broke off her engagement to her fiancé, the old Marquis de Segrave, whom her family had forced upon her. The girl was so enraged by his behavior that she used, though not to the full extent, her magical powers. The Marquis was shaken, twisted, and turned upside down, he was completely unable to resist the girl's powerful energy. And so we caught the moment when the angry girl rebuked the Marquise who was hanging upside down and upside down in front of her. I'll explain this once. Listen carefully. I neither wish nor intend to marry you. We are breaking off our engagement immediately. I am disgusted by scum who measure a person's worth by money. You disgust me. There was yelling, stomping, screaming. My God, what's going on? Marquise Segrave. The girl looked away from her former fiancé, burning with indignation and saw her father and mother screaming and running toward them. Lariette looked away from her unhappy fiancé, and the duke at this time tried with his magic power to suspend the effect of the girl's energy on their much-desired future relative. The Marquis fell. He was trembling from what he had seen and the shame he felt. What horror, what dishonor, he stammered. I shall never forget it. The girl's parents helped him up, shook him off, tried to calm him down somehow to make up for what had happened. They persuaded him not to hold a grudge. Marquis, please, our daughter was stupid. They led him by the hand to their mansion. But the Marquis was undeterred. No, he cried, stammering. No, no, no. Consider it done. What an outrage. Lariat looked at this picture with sadness. In front of her were a family who valued money more than their own daughter and a disgusting Marquis who bought people with money. How tiresome it all was. The girl felt devastated, unwanted, misunderstood, disappointed. Her father continued to court the Marquis, and her mother came back again, screaming and indignant. You must be out of your mind. Angrily, she spat out reproaches and insults at her rebellious daughter. Yes, Lariette replied calmly and modestly. I'm still late. It should have been done earlier. How did I not go mad in this family, she thought. At that moment, her father jumped up in a blaze of indignation. You, what have you just done? Do you want the Duchy of Blanche to drown in debt? And who ran up all these debts? Why do I have to pay them? 
You're a family that has no interest or love for me. You sold me so that you could enjoy wealth and luxury. And what do I get? Only beatings, insults, insults, and indifference. What about the clothes you wear? The food you eat? The place where you sleep? The Duchess's mother has joined in. Why don't you appreciate it? After all, you have the opportunity to enjoy all this just because you are a duke's daughter. Then you should be responsible. But I'm not idle. I do the bookkeeping and the problems of the duchy, even though those are your duties, mother. I look after the estates, though that is Brother Rand's job, but that responsibility was mine as well. I even had to agree to marry in order to pay off my father's debts. So why did you arrange all this? The duke's father shouted indignantly. You should have just done your job. We raised you, never denied you anything, pampered you. And you, you've forgotten your place. That's enough. That's it. I'm cutting you out of our family tree. Get out now. The duke continued to shout. Mother Lariat tried to stop him. Dear, that's a bit harsh. What's in it for me in the family tree? The girl replied. It's a trivial piece of paper that's about to burn. Does it matter? Most of all, I was afraid that you would cross me out of your hearts, she said sadly and reservedly. But it turned out that I was never there. The girl bowed deeply to her parents. Thank you for everything, her ladyship Duke Blanche, Duchess, said Lariat, and she went out of the house. The mother seemed a little upset by the unexpected turn of events but the father continued to rage. Don't even think about taking anything from the duchy, he shouted at his daughter. The girl's brother, Rayan, did not fail to join in. He also shouted accusations at her. He accused her of destroying family values, although in his heart he was happy about his sister's departure from home. He laughed at the fact that she was less educated in magic than he was. He chided her for her arrogance. Then, in an effort to hurt Lariat as much as possible, Rayan sent magical energy in her wake. He was sure that she would not be able to resist. The girl turned and sent a stream of her own magical energy in the direction of her brother's magical power. Rayan was literally knocked off his feet. He tried to resist, but was unsuccessful. Finally, he was driven into the ground up to his neck. Well, Rayan, it turns out that I'm stronger than you. The girl turned and walked away. She didn't look back. Her brother's screams continued behind her, but she didn't respond to them. Only Anne, the devoted maid and helper, worried about Lariette. She rushed to her mistress with bitterness and compassion. My lady, how can it be? I am with you. Anne wanted to follow her mistress, to accompany her, to help her, as she had done before. But Lariat resolutely stopped her and persuaded her not to follow. I'm going to die anyway, it doesn't matter. So our heroine left her father's house. In the evening, a very tired Lariat, barely shaved, walked through the city towards the unknown. And what's the bottom line? She thought unhappily, analyzing everything that had happened. But here was a surprise, thinking about it even cheered her up a bit. It's not that bad. After all, I've already fulfilled three of my wishes. One, I gave Anne a cake. Two, I broke off my engagement to the Marquis de Sagrave. Three, I have left home and gained my independence. Now I have two more things to accomplish, to meet a handsome young man and to make the journey to the West of which Rayon had spoken so much. Here the thoughts of our young heroine began to revolve around the handsome man with whom she would spend the last three months of her life in love. Since she had no experience of love, and her ideas about love came only from books. Two images of young, attractive, handsome men appeared in her imagination. One was brunette, the other blonde. Lariette smiled dreamily as she imagined how she would experience an unexplored feeling with one of them. The only thing she wished for in any of the possibilities was that the man next to her had a wealth of love experience, that it would be easy for them to go out together. Then Lariette's thoughts returned from daydreaming to everyday life. It's good that I have some money with me but I want to enjoy the remaining months of my life to the fullest, which means I need to earn more of it. And to do that, I need to do what I do best. What was her best skill? She was good at cleansing magic. And the girl walked into the agency that provided jobs for magicians with hope, confidence, and determination. I'm a purification mage here for a job, she exclaimed, hoping that her financial problem would be solved here. Let's stop here. You should know that purification magic is an unpopular sorcery compared to healing magic. It is less effective and requires a huge amount of mana. In addition, you should know that healing and purification magic cannot be used on people with higher magic power than the mage, nor can it be used on oneself. The same rule applies to holy powers. So the girl came to work confident that she could use her knowledge as a purification mage. But she heard a refusal. She was told no firmly and indifferently. We don't want purification mages, and we have enough healers. This news shocked the girl. Lariette tried to argue somehow, to convince her employer, but she was once again firmly told to get out and not to interfere with the work. And then she was literally pushed out of the room. 
This girl is already too indignant, a complete failure, she thought as she walked down the street, not holding back tears of resentment and frustration. We should look for another place that needs workers. It was then that she felt a tug. It was her bag, which contained all her savings and all available means of subsistence being tugged from her shoulder. The robbers ran away. Stop, thieves, cried the girl, but they rushed away laughing. We are not afraid of the mages of purification? Suddenly, they felt something happening to them and around them. Flashes of light and streams of energy rushed toward them. It was Lariette trying to stop them with her magic. Stop, I said, she shouted, and flashes of light streamed from her to the robbers. They howled in fear but kept running trying to escape. Oh, I can't catch up with them, the girl assessed the situation. Help, help, she began to scream. In the last chapter, Lariette was refused a job. On top of that, the robbers snatched her purse with her savings and ran away. No matter how hard Lariette tried to catch up to them and stop them, she couldn't, so she started screaming for help. Help, help! Her scream was heard, and the fugitives were blocked by a tall, stately passerby. The robbers stood still. They saw the man in black standing before them. What's that? The smell, said one of them. It smells like a rotting corpse. It's terrible. Could it be the Duke of Candle's monster? Said one of them with a trembling voice. Lariette heard the clatter of metal and an incomprehensible squelching. Later, when she saw the sword in the stranger's hand, she realized what had happened. The stranger approached her and held out the stolen bag. The girl looked at him closely. Oh, so it wasn't the coachman, it was Duke Kendell himself. The girl recognized him. It was him, the representative of the most powerful duchy in the Hassan Empire, the man they call the first sword of the empire. He was the general who brought victory to the country in a war that was doomed to defeat. Because of his ruthless nature, he was nicknamed the Ghost of War. The girl thanked him with embarrassment and accepted the bag. Then she took another look at him. Yes, he's incredibly handsome. The smell is a bit repulsive, but his face is shining, so no big deal, she thought. And immediately she blushed. I really like him, Lariette thought, embarrassed. With a face like that, he's probably been in a lot of relationships. And since he's known for being cold, he probably wouldn't just be picking up random passers-by. This is great. He must like me too. The girl shivered, not knowing why. From cold, from fear, from excitement. At this time, Duke Kandel also thought of her. She looks like a noblewoman, but she walks without a guard. She's trembling, probably afraid of me, he thought. But until the curse is lifted, I will always have to face her fear, even though I helped her. I'm probably trying for nothing. How long will I have to do this, he thought sadly. Listen, he heard a voice and jumped. Do you have a girlfriend? It was a beautiful stranger standing before him. I like your face. Be my friend for exactly three months. It was Lariette remembering her dying wish to meet the handsome man. The young man felt uncomfortable at the stranger's offer. Shall we get acquainted first? She said. I'm Lariette Blow, but she stopped herself at once, deciding not to use her surname or to indicate that she belonged to the Blanche family. Just Lariette, she continued. What's your name? I know, she thought, but I'm asking out of politeness. And I am Aslahan Candle muttered the young man, even recoiling from her assertiveness. Wow, you have a nice voice, too. The girl flashed him her eyes. Such a charismatic, deep timbre, she said admiringly. Nice to meet you, Aslahan, Lariette said sincerely. What's going on here, wondered the Duke. Is she playing a joke on me? The Duke involuntarily clenched his fists in tension. Really? Is it possible that someone is calling me Aslahan for the first time in 20 years? Will you go out with me, the girl continued. Only three months. Aslahan snorted. You saw how I hacked those men to pieces, didn't you? Aren't you afraid of me? Enough of your jokes, he said, turning and walking away. The girl had no choice but to go her own way. Duke Candle looked back. I knew it. She just couldn't mean it, he thought. What a great guy he is, the girl thought. Blood rushed to her face. What a cool, charismatic guy he is. And sexy, too. How can he have all those qualities? But still, there was something that such a gorgeous man didn't have. There's a fire in her eyes. Me, he doesn't have me. Wait, Aslahan, I will make sure you have everything. The girl went to the nearest place for a snack. There were many visitors. There was a buzz of voices. But our heroine thought of nothing, heard nothing, except how she could meet the Duke again. Suddenly she heard fragments of sentences. Information Guild? The same Duke Candle? Ah, uh, apparently the rumor was true, someone said. Another voice replied, Yes, it seems the rumor that he was looking for a purification mage was true. The girl approached the man talking about Aslahan. What rumor? What rumor are you talking about? The man at the table asked her. That the Duke is looking for a purification mage. It is known that the Duke is under a terrible curse, he continued. 
If you go near him, you can smell death. The smell of death, Lariat interjected. The smell of rotting corpses, the man replied. Ah, that's the strange smell I've been smelling. I wouldn't say it's completely horrible, the girl thought. The interlocutor continued. Anyway, they say he was looking for a cleansing mage in the information guild to lift the curse. But the curse is so serious that purification mages just run away. And there aren't that many of them. So that's it. Lariat took in the information and pondered. Let's stop there. And to clarify, cleansing magic requires more mana than healing magic. And it was created to remove curses. However, compared to the number of people who are cursed, there are more people who die by the sword. That's why it's unpopular. And that's why Aslahan couldn't find a capable purification mage. Let's find out what happened next. The girl answered understandably. Fire flashed in her eyes again. I am the mage you need. Wait for me, Aslahan, she said determinedly. A week later, Duke Candel's doorbell rang. Lariat stood on the threshold. I found it, she exclaimed. So Lariat stepped on the threshold of Duke Candel's castle. The owner came out to greet his unexpected guest. To say that he was surprised is to say nothing. The girl swallowed excitedly, thinking, the expression on his face is really frightening. But she said aloud, you must have been confused when I asked you to go out with me. So why don't we start with the employer-employee relationship? Let me introduce myself again. I'm the best purification mage in the empire, and I will free you from the curse. Hmm, she's not afraid of me. Are you ready to take responsibility for what you just said? The duke asked her. If this is a bad joke, he leaned over the uninvited guest slightly. It is unlikely that you will see the sun tomorrow morning. The girl trembled. Even though I didn't learn magic the way I should, I have a good grasp of purification magic. So it's okay, she assured him. And she thought to herself, I'm going to die anyway. I have nothing to fear. And smiled. Lariat took the duke's hands. The young man flinched in surprise. Something happened around them. A kind of luminescence enveloped them like a cocoon. Something crackled. Rivers of energy flowed around them. Oh, this is taking a lot more mana than I thought, Lariat thought. The curse is too strong. And as my magic collides with Aslahan's curse, the energies become unmanageable. The girl staggered. My physical strength and my mana are completely exhausted, thought the girl. But aloud, she suggested to Aslahan to test her abilities. Don't get your hopes up, said Duke Kendall. You know very well that it won't work anyway. He raised a hand bandaged with many layers. I know how powerful this curse is. I've had it since I was a child, he explained. He remembered the words of the sorcerer. I'll show you flayed flesh. The stench of rotting corpses will fill the room. I have been under the influence of this curse ever since, and there is no hope for anything. And suddenly a miracle happened. A bright light came from his hand and my skin began to regenerate. The girl laughed. Well, what shall we make a treaty? She asked the Duke. Dazzlingly beautiful magic. Here's the only miracle that can lift my curse. He clenched his fingers into a fist. I don't want to miss this chance. The Duke grabbed her friend's shoulders. I can't let go of my miracle. Until the curse is lifted, I won't let you go. The exhausted girl was trembling. The Duke put his arm around her. The weakened Lariat laid her head on his chest. The young men made a contract that the mage would free the Duke from the curse. In exchange, the Duke agreed to provide the magician with food and lodging for three months. And the exhausted girl literally fell off her feet. The night passed. Suddenly, Lariat shuddered, woke up and crouched fearfully in bed, looking around and not understanding anything. Where am I? She asked, frightened. What's wrong with me? You are awake, Aslahan answered. He was sitting in a chair next to her bed. Where am I? The girl asked again. In the Duchy of Candle, he answered. Your contract stipulated that you be given food and lodging. So I brought you here. If it was rude of me, he continued, to give you lodging. No, I'm very grateful, cried the girl. Well, said the Duke. Now I will keep a copy of the contract with me. Oh, what a handsome man he is, the girl said admiringly to herself and took his hands. It turned out that you had signed the contract. She was pleased. Yes, I am. Because you are the first one who could affect my curse, the Duke replied. Well then, let's shake hands. Lively and cheerful, she went on. Aslahan, I ask you to take care of me from now on, and I in turn will take care of you. The Duke rose from his chair and dryly replied, Our relations with you are limited to the concepts of employer and employee. And he thought to himself, She does not even avoid me. Who is she then? Candle trembled. The girl tried to approach him, but he stopped her with a wave of his hand. I don't know if you've recovered yet, so don't come up. Who the hell are you? The girl continued to chirp happily. Just call me by my first name, Lariat. Just call me Ree. Try it, Ree. The Duke continued to cool her enthusiasm. You fainted, so I just came by to check on your condition. I moved your things, made sure you were okay. Now, if you'll excuse me. Get some rest tonight, and we'll talk tomorrow, the young man said. 
It's a deal, Lariat smiled. The young Duke left, 35. And the girl flopped down on the bed, wrapping both hands around the pillow. Why is he so beautiful? A face like that should be passed down from generation to generation as a family heirloom. Lariat did not hold back her emotions. He seems to have a lot of love experience, the girl thought. But why is he so aloof? I'm not his type. Too bad. But immediately cheered up. Well, nothing changes in taste. And smiled dreamily. She was in a great mood. Everything was going her way. He's so sweet, Lariat said. His beauty takes my breath away. I wonder what it would be like to be so attractive, she continued. Her words came to Aslahan from behind the door. He blushed deeply. Embarrassed, he hid his face in the back of his clenched fist. She is indeed strange, the Duke summed up. Later, the young man sat in his office, reviewing papers and taking small sips of hot coffee, savoring its taste. Suddenly, Lariat entered the room, walked over to the table, and sat down directly opposite the Duke. Silently, she looked at him and smiled. Do you have something to say? He asked her. I was waiting for the moment when you would stop pretending not to notice me. The girl smiled. Why don't you eat with me? She put her hands to her face and looked into his eyes. What? Kandel asked. He almost choked. The cup shook in his hand and some of the drink spilled on his clothes. I was expecting you. I thought for sure we'd have breakfast together. You want to eat with me? That's strange. Apparently you have a good appetite, surprised the Duke and put the cup on the saucer with a clatter. What are you talking about? What's appetite got to do with it? Asked the girl, not understanding and already a little nervous. Wizard, how much do you know about my curse? He asked. I don't know much, Lariat replied. The Duke explained, it is a curse created by a dead man. The caster cast it at the moment of death. Therefore, it is especially strong and cannot be removed by killing the caster. When was it put on you? The girl asked. About seven years old. You probably didn't know that this bandage has a smell-blocking spell on it. This curse is causing the skin all over my body to shrivel and rot. Even with the help of purification mages, the speed of the curse can only be slowed down. That's why I couldn't get rid of it. Aslahan, the girl said sympathetically and took his hand. Are you not hurt? She looked at him with her eyes. Surely it must be an agonizing feeling, how difficult it must be for you. I didn't realize how hard the curse made it for him, and I wanted to use it to my advantage. What was I thinking? She scolded herself. What if she runs away in disgust, he thought. And then he answered himself. Nothing. Then I can just grab her and lock her up next to me. I'm willing to do anything if she can really free me from the curse. I promise you, Aslahan, I will definitely lift your curse. Lariat Blanche has given her word. Duke Kendall was tormented by the question, why isn't she afraid of me? Everyone is horrified when they see my rotting skin, so they avoid meeting me. And when people smell the stench, they start to vomit. But she treated me like a human being, as if there was something nice about me. Even my selfish greed is nothing to her. The girl held the brush in her hand, looked at it carefully, and sighed. Enough! Aslahan pulled his hand from her grasp. Mage, stop, he said, and stopped her impulse by taking her wrists. Her wrists are so thin, he mentally noted. But out loud, he said, there's no need to overdo it. Seven, I don't have much mana right now. I just wanted to check something, Lariat replied. You can already see that the left arm looks almost completely healthy from the outside, but the cleansing magic is still working, she noted optimistically. I think the mana is still working on the inside. I've checked, and I've found that the body has a limit to the amount of cleansing power it can hold. Until the left arm is fully restored, the other places can't be purified. I will be satisfied if the cleansing is done gradually, said the young man. Don't worry. I am responsible for my words, and I guarantee that I will heal you completely before I die, the girl said with a confident smile. To death? exclaimed the young man. I meant to say I would do it as soon as possible, Lariat corrected herself. You'll make a full recovery. Don't worry and trust me. Do you understand? You are not afraid of me, the young man asked, swallowing the lump in his throat. You're not scary? They sat at the table facing each other and talked quietly. And I have a reason to be afraid, the girl asked, coughing deliberately and smiling. And what about the rumors about the ghost of war? You actually won a war that was doomed to failure, and not for nothing was he hailed as a hero who saved the country. What kind of stupid gossip is this? What is it but the intrigues of jealous members of the imperial court who fear that you are becoming too powerful? The first sword of the empire. I think that's a very cool nickname, Lariat said emotionally. As for the curse, I have no words. You should be afraid of the mage who cursed you, not the one who cursed you, she continued. Otherwise, it's just stupidity. Is it wise to fear the victim? We must make the attacker pay for his crime. Lariette clenched her fists, her pretty face showing indignation, determination, and a thirst for revenge. The young man snorted in response. 
So hilarious was the sight. Aslahan, the girl whispered, taking his face in her palms. I am not afraid of you, she said, looking into his eyes. I am not afraid of you at all. I am only afraid that you will refuse to see me. Let go, he said sharply, and twisted out of her arms. Lariat was taken aback by his abruptness and coldness. I'm sorry. The Duke jumped up and leaned on the table. And the girl listened to the sensations in her palms and fingers, his cheeks so tenderly soft. She tried again to feel her impressions of touching his face. Duke blushed. At seven o'clock, meet me for dinner, he said, and headed for the exit. Good, the girl smiled. It was good that they would have dinner together now. See you at dinner, she said after the Duke left. Lariette recovered in her room. She did not even look out of the large, bright window. The girl was absorbed in her impressions. She listened to her feelings, sensations, the slight melody that played in her head. Aslahan was so sensitive to touch, just a little touch on his cheeks, and he had already agreed to dinner. She closed her eyes and again visualized the whole picture of her touching Aslakan's face, remembered the tenderness and softness of his skin, the way he blushed and his subsequent reaction. Suddenly, these pleasant and exciting memories were interrupted by someone's cry. My lady. Halstein, cried the girl. Yes, it was the faithful butler of the Duchy of Candle, Halstein. Have you met the Duke? He asked. Yes, I have. Thanks to you, I didn't get lost and found him right away, the girl replied. I'm glad, and I was also able to arrange a dinner, the girl boasted. You will have dinner together, Halstein asked. Yes, Lariat replied without hiding her joy. I wonder. It had been a long time since the master had eaten in the company of others. After the Duchess died, when he was still a boy, he never shared a meal with anyone. Lariat blossomed at these words. Please take care of the Duke, the butler asked. We'll just have dinner together. Is it so serious? She asked mischievously. Of course, Halstein replied. The girl's smile grew wider and wider. At that time, the Duke was in his study. Before him lay a weighty volume entitled Instructions for an Excellent Date. The Duke acted as if nothing unusual had happened. He looked at Halstein reluctantly and questioningly. Then he tried to explain the situation without revealing his true aims and motives. I was well trained in table manners, he said, crossing his arms over his chest. But that was when I was a child, so I was worried if there were any new rules. I'm really worried that this magician, who is five years younger than me, is going to make me laugh. She'll say, don't you have any manners, and I'll be embarrassed. I'll have to explain that it's just that I haven't studied for a long time. But it wasn't them, the butler noticed. It says date on the book, and recognizing Aslakan's cunning, the butler teased him. Look here! Look here, read it. He narrowed his eyes cunningly and smiled good-naturedly. Halstein began to read some passages from the book. It was polite to pull back a chair for a lady during a meal, to meet her gaze, to look at her with tenderness. I'm not listening, muttered the Duke. That's a useless advice. It has nothing to do with me. What do you mean, useless? Never in all my 27 years of service has it been more needed than now. The Duke tried to wrestle the compromising volume out of the butler's hands. He resisted. They were both out of breath from the jostling and struggling for the book. When they caught their breath, they calmed down a bit. Duke then grabbed his coat and headed for the exit. Why are you wearing a coat? Asked the butler with a smile. You're going to eat at home. You have to hide the smell. Because of the curse, I smell disgusting, replied the Duke as he walked away. It was time for dinner. The girl was already in the living room when she heard footsteps. She jumped up and exclaimed joyfully, Aslahan! The table was set with a variety of food, drinks, and flowers. I didn't think she would be so happy to see you. Aslakan was surprised and sat down at the table. We'll only have dinner together once. The girl brought some more dishes and joined the meal. She sat down beside him. Her mood was wonderful. I'd like to make some changes to the new contract. Would you take a look at it? She turned to him. Go ahead, the Duke replied. To be honest, Lariette began. I think the reward for my cleansing magic is a bit small. Take a look at this. It turns out that young people are very quick to get to the point these days, the Duke noted to himself. But I can pay her as much money as she wants, even enough to buy a small country. The girl showed the Duke her new amendments to the previous contract. The first amendment stated that the representatives of both parties were obliged to eat together once a day. In the second, that the host undertook to agree twice a week to a request for a walk together, and that all costs arising from the items shall be borne by the host party. A request for an outing together? Surprised by the Duke, but Lariette knew for sure that it was a date, of course. So where were we? A walk, wondered the Duke, wanting to add just that. It would be problematic if she ran off and said she hadn't been sufficiently rewarded. She will say, I haven't even been paid enough. I'm out of here. 
God, he thought, what a situation. He grabbed his pen and made his revision to the document. It was as follows. If the representative of the initiating party disappeared without completely releasing the representative of the receiving party from the curse, he would have to accept whatever outcome the receiving party determined. I added something, he said, holding the contract out to her. Okay, the girl replied. I was going to erase it completely anyway, but when it's written into the contract like that, it gets a little scary. All right, let's make a contract, said Lariat. So be it, replied the Duke, and they signed their copies. How would you like to have a picnic tomorrow? The garden here is very large and beautiful, said the girl to the Duke. Tomorrow? I must visit the Imperial Palace, said the Duke. Then the day after tomorrow, the guest immediately proposed. Is there any need to hurry? Was the young man surprised? Yes, he was. I'm in a hurry. Silence hung in the air. There was a question in the Duke's eyes. Of course, to get your love sooner, she said, already in her rosy reverie. The Duke ignored her feelings. Eat, he said coldly, a few days later. Early in the morning, Lariat, young, pretty, excited in a light dress, her hair beautifully done, her eyes shining, stood at the open window. She admired the changes in nature, the exuberance of spring, the blossoming of fragrant flowers and trees in the garden below the window. The ripples of the splashing fountain reflected the rays of the sun. What a wonderful house. And I had the chance to live in such a place, she rejoiced. The mana is already fully restored. If I want to completely purify it before I disappear, I must hurry. I'm going to work! The girl cheerfully turned on her heels and, with her skirts rustling, walked into the room where the Duke was. He looked back at the sound of her footsteps. You're up early, he greeted her. The girl almost screamed. He was so handsome. My goodness, it's like the sun has risen again. So dazzling with his beauty, she thought. The sun called Aslahan never sets. Your face is radiant, she complimented him. What's going on? Aslahan was confused and puzzled. We're going to have a picnic in the afternoon. It's still cold outside, he said. So go back to your place for now. I have a lot of work to do. But the girl walked around the table that always separated them, approached the Duke, and playfully sat down on the table right next to him. You don't have time to get rid of the curse either? She asked. Does that mean that her mana has already recovered? The Duke thought. The girl took his hands. I think the effect will be stronger if I touch bare skin. So I'll take off the bandages. The Duke tensed, but agreed. Elpreet took the bandages from his hands and took his palms in her hands. Hmm, the curse is not strong on the hands, so once will be enough. The magic will work for a few days like last time, and the curse will disappear completely. I can't believe it, he wondered, looking at his hand. I've been searching for a cure for over a decade, but I never thought I could get clean so easily. Are you all right, mage? He asked her. Yes, the girl reassured him. I already got the point. I was too drunk last time. Lariat, who was sitting on the table in front of the duke, leaned over to him, licked his face, and looked straight into his eyes, and asked playfully, "So." Now that we're done with the cleaning, shall we go for a picnic? A short time later, Aslahan pulled away slightly. I told you, it's cold in the morning in spring, but the girl still dragged him into the garden. They were immediately hit by the morning freshness. It was really cool. They both shrank from the cold, the girl in her light dress, shivering. And yet we're on a date, so it all makes sense, the girl said, resting her head on his shoulder. Then she came in as if from the other side and hinted very clearly, if someone covers me with his coat, I'll get warm and she looked at him playfully. I don't want to, as if the Duke had cut her off. She thought that it would be unpleasant if the smell of the curse came out. Of course, you can't catch cold, said the girl. She ran to the grass near the well. Come here, hurry, the sun is warming up, she called to him. A tablecloth was already laid by the bed of daisies, and there was a basket of food. You're so brave, said the Duke. Only with you, she replied. Come, sit closer. The girl made an effort to sit next to the gentleman. No. I like the current distance between us. Aslahan stubbornly ignored her attempts to move closer. The girl was taken aback. She was puzzled as to why he was so reserved with her. Perhaps he was hurt by a former lover. Or am I not to his liking? Of course, I have no experience in love, but you have to show it somehow. I won't be wrong. Such thoughts went through Lariat's mind. Meanwhile, the young man was thinking about something else. I never thought I'd be sitting in a flower garden. You have to keep your distance. Well. The girl clicked the lock and opened the basket. Wow, look at this food. She invited them to share Aslahan's joy. It's going to be delicious, and I will pray for your success in love, said the butler who was watching from the side. Go away, said the Duke. Aslahan, what would you like to eat? Said the girl to the Duke, holding a basket with a bottle of wine, fruits, and various dishes in front of her. I don't really exaggerate. I don't have much of anything, replied the Duke. He doesn't have a favorite dish. Lariat's eyes widened. 
What is the joy of his life in this world? The girl wondered. I like a salmon sandwich, but I don't like the smell of gherkins. True, I can and do eat them when I have to. But to put them on the table on purpose, no. A fragrance of pure beauty, Aslakan thought. The smell, said the duke. Ah, so you don't like gherkins either? That's how the girl understood him. Then here, here you go. She gave the duke a salmon sandwich, happy that at least they had something in common. But the duke, absent-mindedly, took the sandwich, took a bite, and, chewing it, was as if not here, but somewhere in his thoughts. He was really thinking of himself. Since she is a purification mage, her scent must be clean and fresh. The duke thought for a while. She even dilutes the scent of my curse. I wish I could ask her if she can smell the stench of corpses, but somehow she tolerates me. The girl was very upset when she noticed how distant his face was. She even clapped her hands trying to get his attention to distract him from his unknown thoughts. What kind of date is this? Lariette was very sad. But then she decided, no, I won't give up. She had to do something to save the day. So she thought of a way to lighten the mood and she went out to pick some flowers. What are you doing? Wait. Aslakan tried to stop her, but the girl ignored him and picked one after the other. Then she crouched on the bowl of the fountain and wove a wreath of garden flowers and put it on the duke's head. How beautiful it was. Larry had admired it again, but when she saw Aslahan's reaction, she was confused and very upset. He was angry. Don't make fun of me. Aslakan wanted to rip the wreath from his head. I wasn't joking. The girl was very offended. She almost cried. Give it to me! She tried to grab the wreath, but she couldn't hold it and couldn't stand on her own feet. Careful! Aslakan shouted, trying to hold her back, but failing. Everything happened quickly and unexpectedly, and they both fell into the well. When they regained consciousness, they found that the duke was sitting on the ground, Lariette on all fours above him, their faces almost touching. The girl, her eyes wide open, looked at the duke. Oh dear, he said, I think it's time you stopped embarrassing me. We stopped when Lariette and Aslakan fell into the well. They were both wet, in unexpected positions, but very close to each other. How can you be so careless? What if you catch cold now? The duke asked thoughtfully, when the first moment of embarrassment had passed. The young man embraced her lightly, fixing a strand of her hair. I won't catch a cold. I have a strong immune system, she assured him. The duke helped the girl up and out of the well. She was soaking wet. Enough dating for today. Let's go back. Aslahan took her in his arms and carried her to the castle. The date was too short. It's basically a useless, ineffective waste of time, he summarized. Late in the afternoon, the girl was not feeling well. She lay in bed. The duke and Halstein were beside her. The duke looked at the thermometer. You have a very high temperature of 38.5, he said worriedly. Congratulations, for the first time in my life, you get to see me with a cold, the girl laughed. The duke looked at her questioningly. Are you joking now? Sorry, the girl was embarrassed. I have to go to the Imperial Palace again today. That's why I invited the priest. Good, she said meekly. Hmm, I thought she would get cranky and beg me to stay with her, the duke thought. But she's more serious than I expected. He cares about my condition. How wonderful, the girl remarked. The duke headed for the exit. Her behavior is not what it usually is, he thought again. Get well soon, Halstein wished her. Everyone left the girl's room. Sitting in the carriage, the duke continued to think about Lariette. Now that I think about it, how could she have left Blanche's duchy? It's not as if the Blanches could just let their daughter go to another duchy. Things were so twisted that I didn't even think about it. He remembered her endlessly. Aslahan, let's go for a walk. Aslahan, let's eat. Aslahan, let's go out. Anyway, we should investigate the matter, he concluded his thoughts. The coachman stopped his horses to make way for an oncoming carriage heading for his castle. In the carriage, the duke noticed the silhouette of a man with long blonde hair. A priestess, he thought. Phew, what a relief. Suddenly, behind him, the duke noticed that he was smiling. He blushed and covered the smile with his palm. I was smiling, but why? It was so unusual for him. Meanwhile, an unusually handsome man in light-colored clothes with long blonde hair entered the chamber where Lariat was lying. Are you my patient, lady? He asked. I came from the temple. What an impressive appearance, said the girl, embarrassed and flushed. I'm a servant of Altion, said the priest. My name is Doha. He sat down next to the girl. I'm Lariette. She also crouched down on the bed. Let's begin the treatment. The priest looked at her carefully and took her head in his hands. Everything around them lit up with light. Streams of energy flowed through the girl and illuminated everything around her. Lady Lariette, why are you in such a place? He asked. What's wrong with us, Lahan's house? The girl asked. It seemed like a rude question. I'm sorry. The priest kept looking into her eyes, holding her face and channeling healing powers. It is because of my temperament that I am harassed in the temple, he continued. The holy abode has a strict hierarchy. 
It is common for junior priests like me to be insulted by others. Is that so? Lariette listened with interest. So this kind of treatment outside is the responsibility of junior priests, without money. Besides, the elders could get rid of the scar on such a beautiful face. The girl's treatment continued. Meanwhile, she contemplated the exquisite, charming features of the priest. That's it. It's done, he said suddenly. Wow, I feel better, cried the girl. She clearly felt a surge of strength, the departure of weakness and malaise. Lariette looked at him and asked, Can you come closer to me just for a moment? Of course. The priest leaned slightly towards her. The girl put the palm of her hand on his forehead. He covered his eyes. Everything shone. Energy flowed. He had such a grateful face, Lariette continued to admire. And here is Mana's cost, somehow more serious than I thought, she thought. Done, the girl said. The priest touched his forehead. Amazing, he exclaimed. He felt no scar under his hand. Are you a healer? Well, yes, she replied. Would you like to be my healer? I won't charge you any fee. The girl thought, hmm, shouldn't junior priests be poor? And the purification of Aslahan comes first. No, I am too busy, she replied. Then later... Whenever you are free, we'll do, later, perhaps. They sat very close to each other, their hands almost touching. I'll take that as a promise, the priest said. In return, I will continue to treat you free of charge. And if you treat me, I will pay you every time. Blinding, and the face and the conditions, the girl's mind raced. The terms are too good. I can't say no, can I? Lariat talked herself into it. All right, she agreed. They both smiled at the quick resolution of the matter. What a lucky acquaintance. Perhaps we'll become close friends, the priest asked. After all, Lady Lariat, I like you very much, he continued, looking directly into her eyes. A friend, the girl thought. I have never had anyone to call a friend, uh, uh, and so eager to feel what friendship is like before I die. His face excites me, too. The girl remembered one of her dying wishes. Take care of me, Doha, she said with a smile. Yes, and you take care of me, my lady. With that, they said goodbye. The Temple of Altion. Doha enters the temple. When he returns, the younger priests in the temple bow to him. Oh no, it's not just Doha, it's the high priest Michael Dohavelian. Doha walked through the temple. More specifically, the high priest was walking through the sanctuary. At a short distance from him, bowing respectfully, was a junior priest and Joshua's assistant. There could be trouble if the man who will be Pope is constantly absent, he said in a hushed voice, addressing the high priest. Michael Dohavelian looked back. Oh, your scar on your forehead, where is it? exclaimed the high priest in surprise. The healer did it replied Mikhail, touching his forehead. An ordinary healer. Are you saying that this wizard can match your strength, sir? How so? Joshua was indignant and kept splashing his hands. No way! He couldn't believe his eyes and ears. Mikhail chuckled. Yes, now it remains to be seen how it can be. The carriage carrying the duke knocked and creaked, breaking the silence of his rest. But no. There wasn't complete silence in the carriage, but there were other sounds. Yes, there were periodic sighs or murmurs from Aslan. The coachman began to listen to what was going on. To go or not to go? No, it would be better not to go. Yes, indeed. It would be better not to go. What is it? The coachman shuddered. Is he going to kill someone? The duke got out of the carriage and went to the castle. He continued to think. The right thing to do would be not to go to confront the mage. But why does it feel like I have to go? Why do I keep thinking about her? Aslahan, are you there? His guest ran out to meet him, happy to see him home again. It seems to be the first time someone has come out to greet me. An attentive viewer and listener of our story might now recognize the butler's laughing voice somewhere off screen. What about me? I used to come out to see you every day. A cold, the duke began, but the girl interrupted him. It's gone. The priest's skills are excellent, she chirped and took the duke's hand. He said he would come back in two days, heal me, and then I would be fully recovered. Lariat put his hand on her forehead. I'm much better now. See? Yes, the duke withdrew his hand. So free, he noted, and went to the stairs leading to his study. You don't have to come out to greet me, he commented as he went up the stairs. After all, that condition wasn't in the contract. But I missed you, the girl called after him. Did you think of me today? She followed him again, trying to catch up. No, not at all, Lariat rolled her eyes in surprise. That's a strange reaction. You were thinking of me. I said I wasn't. But you were thinking of me. The girl was convinced and insisted. She could barely catch her breath from walking so fast to catch up with the Duke. Oh, how fast he runs. But the girl managed to catch up with Aslakan again. What are you doing tomorrow? I'll work on the documents at the estate. Are you asking about the purification? No. We'll do that in three days. Why don't we make an appointment? Shall we go see a play? Beaming with joy, she showed him the ticket. What is this piece of paper? He asked. Lariat exploded with indignation. Do you have any idea how hard it was to get this? Just a piece of paper? What kind of paper? He asked again. It's a ticket. 
for premium seats to a famous show, the girl replied. Besides, tomorrow is the last show. It won't work, the Duke shot her a look. Why not, the girl almost cried. She's suggesting that I go somewhere with this damned body, he muttered under his breath. As soon as I walk in, everyone will start avoiding me for sure, to watch with disgust. I don't know how easily she accepts my curse, but we must discuss it, the Duke thought. Besides, this is not the time to assert my pride. Mage, are you really not afraid of me? Rumor has it that I'm called the ghost of war for a reason. I have taken hundreds of thousands of lives with a single wave of my hand. The girl looked at him with wide open eyes and listened attentively. For me, closely associated with death, stabbing another with a sword is a common thing. The girl swallowed her saliva in excitement. Yes, I am afraid, but not enough to run away. Suddenly, she pushed him away and slapped his palm. To say that the Duke was surprised and outraged is to say nothing. What? Are you what now? The girl breathed in and out, blood pulsing through her with emotion. I'm going to attack you, Duke Kandel himself. What are you going to do? Also, I often sneak a look at your face and take your hand without consent. And I call you by your name she continued fervently. The Duke recoiled in surprise. And what? Are you going to kill me? Why do you lock yourself up at home, Aslahan? No, no, wait, the girl grabbed his breasts. The Duke flinched. Mage, he tried to stop her, but he didn't. Are you guilty of something, she continued. I just want an answer. Do you want to see the show or not? Don't worry about others, and think of what you want for yourself. She continued to hold him by the clothes on his chest. Then she turned and walked away. Answer me before tomorrow morning, she said sternly and firmly as she walked away. If you say you won't go, I'll go with another man, she cried, and finally went away. Lariat was so carried away that she could not stop. The Duke was stunned by what had happened. Wow, what a scene our heroine made. Aslahan stood where she had left him and could not recover for a long time. The next day, a carriage arrived at the manor. Lariat smiled. Well, then it means that the appointment will be a success. Our heroes went to the fair. The Duke offered his hand to the girl and helped her out of the carriage. When she stumbled a little, the companion picked her up and held her by the waist, much to the surprise of our heroine. How wonderful, she rejoiced. The Duke treated her gallantly. The girl only blinked with pleasure. Suddenly, don't take my hand inconspicuously, said the Duke. But don't mind if I take it by chance. He replied coldly and hid his hands behind his back. The girl was again at a loss, but they went to the performance anyway. There were many people in the hall. There was galloping, noise. Out of unaccustomedness, the Duke jumped at every shout. Nervously, the girl looked at him. Don't be so nervous, Duke, she reassured him. We can go straight into the hall. Our seats are in the box where there is no one but us, she told him. Lariat took him by the arm and led him away. So our heroes attended a theater performance. The play is over, the actors bowed out. The audience enthusiastically and gratefully bade the troupe farewell until next season. Coming out of the hall, Lariat, still under the impression, exclaimed with delight, It was so good. Not bad, the Duke discreetly agreed. The main character is really handsome continued to admire Lariat, remembering the image of the blonde actor who played in the play. Do you like men who look like a prince? There was a slightly sad note in the Duke's voice. No, I like Kasavchiki, hummed our heroine cheerfully. I will go to the toilet. You can go back to the carriage first, she patted her companion on the shoulder. All right, replied the Duke. Lariat was in the ladies' room. She was washing her hands and wiping them with a handkerchief. Her mood was wonderful. A melody was playing in her head, and she hummed it aloud. Now that we're out of the mansion, we might as well eat out, she planned as she walked out into the hall. Larry, suddenly someone called out to her. The girl stopped in surprise. She looked around. Well, no, she didn't want to meet like this. It was the Marquis of Sagrave. He was standing across from her with his arm around the fragile, delicate girl. Oh, I apologize for disturbing you. I was just so happy to see you that I couldn't help myself. What is this all about? I thought I said I wished we'd never met again. The girl began to seethe with indignation. What's the matter? Do you have a hearing problem? Her mood quickly soured, and the tone of the conversation lost all civility. Hmm, I don't know. Are you deliberately not analyzing the situation and not giving yourself credit? Or are you simply incapable of it? The Marquise spoke ironically and arrogantly. After all, who are you now? You're not even a noble woman anymore, so you should know your place. He snapped his fingers and looked at Lariette with disdain. The girl clenched her fist and swung, intending to strike her offender, but as she did, someone grabbed her from behind. A hand covered her mouth and held her arms tightly around her. The girl tried to break free, but was unsuccessful. No, baby, our meeting with you was no accident. As you can see, I planned it, said the Marquis of Sagrave again. I cannot forget the shame of that day, and I promised you that I would not let that kind of treatment go unrevenged. What shall I do now? 
People began to gather at the noise, but the Marquis of Segrave's assistants kept them away, dispersed them, and sent them away. Though since you've stooped to be a commoner, he patted Lariat's cheek roughly, defiantly, humiliatingly. Perhaps he'll take you as his mistress? I will. You're a pretty face, so I'll be generous with you. The Marquis of Segrave tried to make up for his humiliation. The girl struggled in vain in the arms of the men holding her. Suddenly there was a shouting, screaming, crunching. What was it? The girl saw that the face of Sigrev's tormentor, who was standing in front of her, had turned white as chalk. Again, there were some sounds. And she felt the hands that held her loosening and then finally releasing her from their clinging and rough fetters. Duke Kendall stood before her. I waited for you, but you did not return. I have come for you, magician. Those who do not know their place will be defeated, he proclaimed. He held a sword. Around him lay the bodies of defeated enemies. One knelt with his head bowed. Are you disappointed with me now? I have shown my ruthlessness once again. The girl looked at him and could not understand what he was saying. Suddenly, the Marquis of Segrave spoke. How dare you? Do you know who I am? Gradually, he came to his senses. How dare you? Roared the Duke, glaring at the Marquis. Are you talking to me? The angry Duke Kendell took a step toward the Marquis. Marcus Segrave gasped and even crouched down in fear. Wait, cried Lariat to the Duke to prevent him from an irreparable act, and whispered, It's the Marquis. The situation might become problematic. And I am Candle. Yes, the great and powerful Duke Candle, confirmed the girl. The Emperor has recognized my right to lynch, but somehow I have to solve the problem with words. The Duke resented. The girl grabbed his arm. Follow me, and led the way away from the scene of the confrontation. The couple left the room, leaving everything that had happened behind. In the carriage, they rode in silence for some time, looking only at each other, remembering all that had happened to them. The Marquis of Sagrave, then. All you have to do is let him live, thought the Duke. Are you all right? He asked the girl. Lariette could hardly catch her breath. Oh, no, she admitted. She is so shocked by my cruelty that she will probably want to break off the relationship. The Duke assumed the future course of events. He was upset. But soon, a salutary thought came to him. No, it's not that simple. We're bound by the treaty. So it doesn't matter, and it can't affect our working relationship in any way, he reassured himself. Aslahan, he heard. The girl had finally regained her voice. You were so cool. Much cooler than the main character of the show, Lariette said excitedly and looked at him admiringly. It's true, I don't like how easily he resorts to violence. But... Let us consider that it was self-defense, the girl reassured herself, putting her hands on her knees. I see, said the Duke. The girl's reaction was unexpected and took him by surprise. But everything was resolved in the best possible way. They drove on in silence, looking out of the window of the carriage, each thinking of his own. The next day, the priest visited Lariette again. After the cure, did you let your guard down and overexert yourself, Laurie? You are ill again, the priest told her. Be more careful. The girl laughed. Who knew that the cold could come back because of yesterday's treatment? Look, Doha, can an incurable disease be cured by the holy power? She suddenly asked, thinking of something else. Incurable diseases cannot be affected by healing magic and holy power. If there is a possibility of a cure, the disease is said to be highly curable. I see, so I will die eventually. Well, it is possible that a person with a level of holy powers like His Holiness the Pope could cure such a disease, the priest said with a mischievous smile. It should be remembered that he himself was a future pope. And how to meet the pope? The girl asked, barely holding back tears. The priest studied her. Is her mana circuit confused? It's a rare case caused by a large amount of mana. There have been situations where a person has died without intervention. But this girl's level of entanglement isn't serious enough to cause death. She would most likely just suffer from a chronic illness for the rest of her life, he assessed the situation. The treatment isn't easy, but I wouldn't say it will take long. She's a useful magician to me, so it would be a good idea to leave her in debt. They sat side by side and looked at each other. If you don't mind, maybe I should treat you, he asked. Really? I'd be grateful, the girl replied. Then I apologize, said the priest. The girl looked at him questioningly. Doa took her in his arms and held her close. He held her there for a while. Then they were face to face, one hand holding Lariette's head, the other holding her waist. Working with the energies under his control at this time, he treated the girl. That's all for today, he said. You'll need to do this a few more times, he said, stroking her cheek. Thank you, Lariette said. If you're grateful, perhaps you can help me a little, my lady. We'll find out what happened next in the next chapter. So Doa turned to Lariette. If you're grateful, will you help me, my lady? The girl raised her eyelashes and nodded in agreement. She was indeed grateful to him. Besides, he was so handsome that our heroine was willing to help him in any way she could. The priest rolled up the sleeve of his robe. 
Oh, the horror. His arm was torn from the wrist to the elbow. Oh, cried Lariat. How did you hurt yourself so badly? She cautiously touched the wounded arm. This is how it happened, replied the priest. The girl immediately began to heal and led Manu to the priest's wounds. And then, right before their eyes, everything began to heal and healed completely. It was as if the wound had never happened. Wow, I really wasn't wrong. I was right to hurt myself to test the mage's abilities, Doa concluded. Lariette, on the other hand, collapsed on the bed in utter exhaustion. Somehow this treatment had taken a strange amount of mana, she wondered. But you and I, dear viewer, know the answer to her question. Of course, it took a lot of mana, for she was not treating a junior priest, as Doha had presented himself to her. In front of her sat the high priest of the Temple of Altion himself, the future pope, Michael Dohavelian. Thank you, my lady, thanked the priest. Here is the payment for the healing. He held out a jewel to her. The girl was amazed. How could this be possible? You, a lowly priest, are giving me a jewel? My family opened a mine, Doha lied to her. Wow, I earned such a stone in just one session, rejoiced Lariat. She jumped up, unrestrained in her emotions, and bowed playfully to the priest. As long as I live, I will serve you as my client. See to me, don't you dare look for another mage to take my place, said the girl. Do you always have that reaction when you are surprised? laughed the priest. Of course, I will not look for anyone, again chuckled the priest. And he thought to himself, I'm not going to. Rather, it's you, Rie. Don't even think about running away from me. The next day, good morning. Are you looking for the master? The butler greeted the girl with these words. Yes, she replied. Do you happen to know where Aslahan is? The master returned very late last night, so he is sleeping now, explained the butler. Oh, she was saddened. Do you wish to personally wake him up? Asked the butler. Lariat's eyes shone. May I? Of course, smiled the butler, a paragon of kindness. If we continue to understand each other so well, and he helps me to marry, I will have nothing more to wish for, she thought. The master's chamber is over there. The butler pointed to the door behind which the duke was. Open it quickly! Lariat opened the door, took a step, and stopped. It was my first time in Aslahan's room. The room that appeared before her eyes was magnificent. Wow. This place is beautiful, she exclaimed. The girl quietly approached the duke's box. Good morning. She greeted the young man she was so fond of. Aslahan jumped to his feet in surprise. A mage? He crouched down in bed. How did you get here? Not understanding anything, he blinked his eyes. At the same time, the butler mentally urged him. Come on, sir, do something. The girl sat down on the edge of the bed. It will be very convenient to do the purification in the bedroom. So we'll finish quickly. What do you mean? Aslahan could not understand what was going on and what they wanted from him. Today we will begin the cleansing of the upper half of the body. The effect on the curse will be better if you touch bare skin, Lariette explained. So take off your clothes, ordered the girl. The duke looked at her, stunned and embarrassed. Or shall I undress you, she continued. No, Aslahan cried in fear and began to rustle his clothes and take them off. How shameful, the young duke blushed. Mage, the bandages have to be removed as well, he clarified. I have to touch my naked skin. The girl was also slightly embarrassed and blushed. The young man began to remove the bandages, releasing his torso, neck, and arms one by one. The girl looked on with interest. As the body was freed from the bandages, a depressing sight appeared before her eyes. The curse is serious. This is really shocking, she thought. Well, I'll just check first. She lightly touched the skin on his chest with her fingers. The energy began to work. The amount of damage from the curse is massive, so you can't do it all at once, she explained. But I'll try. And she put her hand on her patient's heart area. And suddenly, from her hand, there was a powerful movement of energy throughout the victim's sternum. The light of mana grew bigger and bigger and spread over the body, the injured skin and the surrounding space sparkling, sparkling, and illuminating everything around. The girl was practically hugging him too close, Aslahan thought. Oh, oh, I used too much mana, she complained, and I practically fell on his chest. A magician, exclaimed the duke in horror. To be honest, Lariat said with a weak voice, I treated the priest yesterday, so I have very little mana left. We have become friends, she continued. But from now on, I'll use my power more carefully so that it doesn't interfere with the purification. So, can I help you with more than just you? Hmm, so you do it with your new friend as well? Aslahan asked. What exactly? Our heroine tried to clarify. Well, no. What am I talking about, thought the young man. The priest is a girl, so I shouldn't worry. But out loud, he said, do what you want. Aslahan, Lariat called him softly, nestling against his chest. When will you finally meet me? This question embarrassed the duke again. 
He wanted to defend himself, but the girl suddenly slipped from his chest and literally fell onto his lap. Mage, what's wrong with you? He called to her, frightened. But the girl was unresponsive. The Duke clenched his fists. After that, Lariat ran all over the estate looking for the Duke. She looked in every nook and cranny, calling out to him, Aslahan, where are you? She even cried. But she could not find the young man. Aslahan continued to avoid me. Apparently, I was too persistent. He was very frightened. She came to this conclusion. Meanwhile, the girl had nothing to do but turn her attention to Doha, with whom she had become close, while Aslahan desperately hid and avoided any communication with her. When Lariette met with the priest, she discussed Aslahan's treatment with him, trying to avoid discussing the curse. As friends, they talked about many things, including her relationship with the Duke. Doha must have dated a lot of young ladies, the girl concluded. Not for nothing does he give such good advice about love. What do you think of the suggestion to make the Duke jealous? The priest continued the conversation and took her by the hair. You know, there isn't a man who doesn't realize his feelings when he sees a girl important to him with someone else. M. He twisted a lock of her hair around his finger. Hmm, but I don't have the right guy for that, Lariette said. I haven't had many boyfriends, and because of my fiancé, I didn't even have any male friends. The priest squinted as he continued to play with her hair. That's cruel, he said suddenly, running his hand through her hair. Then holding the back of her head, he pulled the girl's face toward him so that their lips almost touched. I'm a man too, Lariette. Do you remember where we left the characters of the Manwa in the last chapter? Doha was pulling the girl towards him, the faces and lips of the priest and Lariette almost touching. I am a man too, he said. So the young people continued to sit very close to each other. At the same time, the energies directed by the priest penetrated the girl. Hmm, he is talking to me and healing me at the same time. I'm surprised. By the way, this idea of making the Duke jealous doesn't seem so bad and hopeless, Lariette thought. She imagined Aslahan, tormented, radiating jealousy and begging her, Sorceress, please don't leave me. Do you want to see me go mad? That's quite a view. She mentally enjoyed the image and blushed with pleasure. On the other hand, it's not so good. Being jealous would put the Duke in a bad state. It would prevent him from purifying himself. No, I think I'll try to manage on my own. So Lariette summarized her thoughts and thanked Doha for her help. Fire flashed in her eyes and her hands clenched into fists. Wait, my sweet kitten, I will seduce you with my powers, she said determinedly. The full moon floated high in the starry sky. The clouds hung motionless. Suddenly, the door creaked open. Duke Candel appeared on the threshold. Here he is at last, thought the furious Lariat. Her eyes burned like a predator's in the night. She sat on the stairs, outraged at the Duke's behavior and ready to tear him apart. Why are you awake? Aslahan asked her. I was waiting for you. You are such a busy person that it is very difficult to see you, the girl said ironically. Let's dot all the I's and cross all the T's today. She approached him with determination, her skirts rustling. Have you forgotten that according to the contract, we have to go for a walk twice a week? Do I feel sick to my stomach? The Duke listened to his senses. Or not. Is it the heart? When I stand in front of the Enchantress, I feel very strange. He tried to understand what was happening to him. That's why I avoid her. I don't want to feel any stranger. Aslahan looked away. Would you like to go for a walk in the garden tomorrow, he suggested. After all, the terms of the contract had to be kept. I feel like I'm the only one holding on to this relationship, Lariette thought. He'll be fine as long as I purify him, except that I'm facing death. My time is running out. She remembered everything that had happened in her house at Duke Blanche's. Her brother, how he had abused her, how her parents had given in to his actions, allowing him to kick her off the dinner table, how they had practically sold her youth to that disgusting old man, the Marquis of Segrev, by engaging her for money, and how angry they were with her when she broke her engagement to him. Remembering her former feelings, desires, and experiences, Lariette said to herself, No, I don't want to submit to the will of another and give up as I had done before. She was alarmed and decided to carry out her goals and decision in life. You must be very busy. Come to think of it, you don't have to force yourself to eat and walk with me at all. The Duke is busy and I'm just distracting him, she said. The Duke couldn't understand what was going on. What was the change in his guest's mood and behavior and how he should react to it? Well, it's nothing. While the Duke is busy, I'm going out to dinner with my priest friend, so I won't complain about this breach of contract on your part. Go and do your work. The girl turned and ran up the stairs. The Duke was left standing in bewilderment. Lariat lay on her bed on her stomach. In front of her was a diary containing her last wishes. She read them again. Buy Anna cake, start raising money, break off the engagement to the Marquis with scandal. Corrects her earlier wish to remain polite in this breakup. What remains unfulfilled? 
to date a handsome man for three months and to make the journey to the West of which Rayon had spoken so much. The girl remembered his boast. During the journey to the West, my skin became so tanned. The water is good. The air is good. The people are good. His parents asked him, did you have fun? Tell me, what did you do there? And Lariette stood back, feeling that no one needed him. My father gave me this notebook. She remembered and looked at the gift inscription her father had written on the cover of the notebook, and he gave Ryan a sword decorated with jewels. Lariette read the entry again. Journey to the West. I've never traveled before. So why can't I do what I want to do, at least before I die? She asked herself. To go out with a handsome man. She read, why did I want to do that so badly? To take some happy memories with me. That's not so bad. She imagined the dialogue with Aslakan, his objections. It would be a burden, complicate the process of magical purification. And then she mentally parried, but you didn't express any reluctance when you were with me. But the eyes with which you looked at me, the day you attended the performance. Lariette remembered the look in his eyes. I must try to do something about it, she decided. But I'm a bit lonely right now. She buried her face in the pillow. Meanwhile, in the temple of Altian, High Priest Michael Dachevelian was choosing his robes to change into for the city. This is what everyone wears, isn't it? He asked his assistant, Junior Priest Joshua, who looked on with displeasure. You've been wearing lower priest clothes a lot lately. A person with amazing success and advancement in status, with superior divine power, could there really be anything else you need? That one is resentful, muttering, and indignant. Are you going to see this witch healer again? Yes, replied the priest. I have heard that she serves Duke Candle. If her identity is revealed, it will be a real disgrace to the church, Joshua continued. Can't we just take her to the Temple of Altion? Who would refuse to serve the future pope? Well, I'm an ordinary man, the priest replied. Terrible character. Well, well. If Mikhail himself is interested in it, there is no question. Finished his attempts to stop the priest through his assistant. I'm going, said the priest and headed for the exit. On the way to the duke's estate, the priest pondered. It can't be said that I don't know anything about Lariette, the duke's daughter Blanche, bride of the Marquis de Segreve, whose recent actions are very alarming. Excellent healing skills and a huge supply of mana. The image of the girl was before his eyes. It is clear that she is a cleansing sorceress, for she is bound to Duke Candle, who longs to be cleansed of the curse. It's clear that Duke Candle will spare no expense for a cleansing sorceress. Well, Lariette is in love with the Duke. It won't be easy for me to make her my healer, but you must try to make it happen. Flirting when the relationship is shallow isn't that hard, especially since I like her a lot. How in the world am I supposed to seduce this girl, thought the priest. As he approached the castle, he was surprised to see her running towards him with open arms and a happy smile. Doha, are you free today? Oh yes, why? Spend it with me. We'll eat, make jokes. But Lariette knew for sure that it was she who had started the operation to make the duke jealous. Of course, my lady, Doha replied. But he decided that he would definitely try to seduce Lariette, and he asked her out, on the pretext of the operation. Lariette and Doha went for a walk in the city. Each of them had slightly different goals in mind, aside from the walk itself. Lariette was planning a jealousy operation, while Doha wanted to seduce the girl and eventually make her his personal healer. Anyway, they were young, they were beautiful, and the weather was nice. Our couple decided to indulge in desserts. They succeeded to perfection. Coming out of the pastry shop, Lariette laughed. I told you, I have a separate stomach for sweets. By the way, you are also a great dessert eater. I have a sweet tooth, he smiled. By the way, Doha, she suddenly changed the subject. Why are you in the field treatment business? I mean, you have a lot of money. She really believed that Doha's parents had opened a mine. Yes, I don't travel much, Doha replied, and this time, ahem. The priest quickly thought of what to say, how to explain the reason he had taken to treat Lariat. This time someone forced me. It was common for clerics to force junior priests to perform healings. Lariette looked at him compassionately. She felt so sorry for her buddy who was being treated so unfairly that she even cried a little. Then her face and posture changed dramatically, becoming threatening, aggressive. Our heroine pursed her lips, frowned, and said firmly, Don't worry. If the elders bully you, tell me I will avenge them for you. That's funny, Doa thought with interest and good irony as he watched Lariat's metamorphosis. My holy powers are greater than her mana, he thought, but she's close to my level. She has no idea how powerful she is. I just don't know how long my interest in her will last. And he asked aloud, Will you take revenge? How? The girl clenched her fists and answered confidently, I can burn my clothes in front of everyone or hang myself from a tree. Just say the word. I'm grateful even for your words, Doha replied. And he continued to analyze, to draw conclusions about the level of magical knowledge, skill, and power Lariette possessed. So she also has elemental magic. 
They continued on their way, and Doha continued to think. She will gain no advantage from opposing the temple. It is nothing but talk. Suddenly, the girl's gaze fell on the window of the jewelry store they were passing. She looked at the jewelry displayed in the window and admired it, thinking, this brooch would look so good on Aslahan. What are you looking at? asked Doha, noticing that the girl was interested in something. He approached her. Lariat jumped, as if her companion had surprised her thoughts. They both crouched near the display case. Uh, uh, nothing. Just, he didn't know what to tell the girl. I was looking at the jewelry. Here's one that would suit you. She found an answer. I'll ask the price. She was sneaky. Doa smiled. But I don't need it, he thought, and loudly supported her. Uh-huh, well, go ahead. The girl hurried to the jewelry shop. Doha waited for her in the street. Suddenly, he felt a rather strong pressure on his shoulder. Why doesn't the younger priest apologize to the older one? Doka heard this and looked around. It turned out that these words were addressed to him. In front of the priest stood the young priest who had pushed him. Doka was very surprised. He continued, Do you even know who I am? Indignant and arrogant, he rebuked Doha. I am a talent who has risen to the rank of an ordinary priest in only five years. Don't do anything you'll regret, Doha said. What? You have no respect or fear for your superiors? shouted the angry priest, looked Doha in the eye, and grabbed him by the chest. Why don't we just kill him? Doha glared at the angry little man. And he could very well do that. If one used the holy power of the high priest level at full power, one could incinerate the man. 24. No, I don't want to reveal my identity yet, especially since there are many observers here. The priest looked around and assessed the situation. There are many ways to deal with him, so I'll leave it at that for now. And then he thought of a strange way to end the incident. Suddenly, Doha bowed humbly before the young clergyman, who was puffing himself up and trying to exalt himself in every possible way. I'm sorry, Mr. Senior Clergyman, I made a mistake. Ha, he was pleased. You've finally come to your senses, he exclaimed, looking around proudly with his arms at his sides. At that moment, flames suddenly erupted and engulfed the young priest's robes. Clothes, my clothes are on fire, he cried out. His clothes were indeed on fire, and his red underpants with bears on them were visible to others through the large gaps in the burnt rags. Doha, like everyone else, watched in amazement. The priest himself was amazed, for he had made no effort. Suddenly, he heard Lariat's excited voice. Doha, run. She grabbed his arm and pulled him after her. They ran. The priest could hardly keep up with the girl who was running down the street with a look of pride and accomplishment on her face. So you made it? He guessed. When they had run far enough, they stopped near a building. I told you I'd get my revenge, she said excitedly satisfied. Don't worry, if there are any problems... I'll confess everything myself, the girl reassured the priest. The priest listened to all this while laughing, but then he also laughed. You laugh like a scoundrel. Lariat couldn't understand why he was laughing and became angry. Doha couldn't stop. He just bent over laughing. <laughs> Unable to stop laughing, he buried his face in her shoulder. The girl was at a loss to understand Ark's reaction. After all, she had protected Doha from being humiliated by the subject. You are so entertaining, the priest said affectionately. So much so that I'd really like to have you, he thought, and calmed down. Doha put his arms around the girl and pressed her against him, holding her ample and beautiful head. At this time, the duke was sitting in his study, angrily pounding his fist on the table. After all, Lariette and the priest had been walking around town all day. The duke was furious. It was also good that the priest, Lariette's friend, was my lady and not a man. That thought calmed him a little. No, sir, the priest is a man, not a woman. Beside Aslahan, with a worried face, stood his faithful butler. Friend Lariette is not a woman, but a man, he repeated. Sir, there will be great trouble if this is allowed to continue. Please, at least try to eat together. There's no telling what your relationship will become. The Duke was shocked by the news. He could not have imagined such a thing. He jumped up from his chair and paced around the office, not knowing what to do or how to act. Aslahan imagined Lariette and the male priest walking through the streets of the city at that time. It hurt him, his heart pounding, blood rushing to his head. So what? Try to distract him somehow. Try to calm him down. Try to convince him. Even if they start dating, it won't have anything to do with me. Lariat is just a mage, a man who's just lifting my curse. He rested his face in his palms and exhaled intermittently. And her suggestion that we go out is just temporary childishness. It's enough that she purifies me. What more do I want? But the thoughts that disturbed, irritated, troubled his heart kept pounding in him like heartbeats. Tootum, tootum, tootum. What do I want? The Duke tried to understand himself, his feelings, desires, and emotions. It's all boiling inside. Who could ever like a monster like me? 
She only comforted me out of pity. There is no need to misunderstand her attitude towards me. In the morning, Lariette was invited for breakfast. Why did you suddenly see fit to visit me? The girl asked. I wanted to talk to you. We haven't talked in a long time, Aslahan explained. Yes, perhaps you are not so busy that you can spare time for our conversation, the girl said, joining the meal. But she had something else on her mind. Had the jealousy tactic worked? In her mind, she clenched her fists joyfully and victoriously. Doha really is a walking encyclopedia of relationships. Then, distracted from her inner triumph and victory celebration, she looked at the Duke. What a face he has. Well, simply breathtaking. Such beauty can conquer the universe. How did you do? Aslahan asked with a slightly trembling voice. Good. Having fun with a friend. She pretended to have little interest in the topic and turned the conversation to the dishes on the table. No pickles? That's fine. Is he jealous? I was having fun with another man, she thought. She glanced furtively at the Duke. Ha, huh, I see, the Duke reacted to the girl's remark. By the way, Doha is coming again this afternoon. We'll stay in my room. So you don't have to worry, the girl said with an artificial naivety, looking into the Duke's eyes. I am not worried, he replied very reservedly. Silence hung in the air. Not jealous? The girl broke the silence. The Duke blushed deeply. We have seen that Lariette concluded that the priest's recommended practice of making Aslakan jealous was very effective. It was jealousy that caused the change in her relationship with the Duke. And wanting to feel the satisfaction of defeating the Duke once again, Lariat pretended to be naive and asked him, Aren't you jealous? No, I'm not jealous. I don't care at all. The Duke answered the girl's question with a cold, slightly ringing voice. The main thing is that it doesn't interfere with the purification process. I see, said the girl. In Lariat's trembling hand, the fork clanked treacherously against the dishes. Her ego was wounded again. The girl jumped up. The Duke looked at her questioningly. I'm not hungry, I'll go first, Lariette said as she left the table and walked out of the dining room. The Duke was left to breakfast in proud solitude. A priest entered Duke Candle's mansion. He found Lariette in her room. She was so upset that she did not even raise her head to greet him. What is it? What's wrong, he asked. The girl was sitting on the bed, leaning forward with her hands between her knees. She was obviously very upset about something. It didn't work out, she said sadly. Doa smiled, understanding the reasons for the girl's grief. It just couldn't work with the Duke of Candela himself, he thought. Would that pervert be jealous? Now we just have to bait her well and she'll be mine. Lariat sat up, dropping tears. The priest plopped down beside her and put his arm around her shoulders. Don't get too upset. It's embarrassing that we only talk about me. The girl looked up at Doa. Ouch. Why are you wearing glasses, she wondered. You look like a librarian. It suits you very well. It's just that for some reason I felt like I should wear it, Doa replied. And my feelings usually don't deceive me. Let's stop here. It should be said that Dohawellian uses prophecy. This is an ability that only outstanding believers possess. It's also an important criterion for choosing a pope. Dohawellian, in particular, uses this special ability to make himself horoscopes for the day. This is something to know before we move on to the next story. What? Do you like it? He asked the girl who was looking at him without taking her eyes off him. You're beautiful, Doha. Everything suits you. A ray of light came from the priest. Lariette recoiled from the light. I thought to myself, I am purified by his beauty. Ah, that's it? The priest put his arm around the girl's waist and pulled her toward him. Then he pressed his forehead against her forehead, looked directly into her eyes and said, Then let us begin the treatment. Duke Condell was sitting at his desk in his study, covering his face with his palm and sighing heavily. It is useless to interfere, declared the butler who had entered the room. But he looked sternly at the duke. Your words have hurt my lady. If you were going to behave like that, you shouldn't have invited her to breakfast. How could you do that to my lady? He was indignant as he continued to rebuke his host for his faux pas and tactlessness. He made no objection. Later, the duke went to the cooks and ordered them to remove the pickles from the dishes. When the butler heard this, he remarked sympathetically, yes, it was the first time he had ordered someone else's food. The duke definitely felt that his feelings were in chaos. He kept thinking of Lariette. He saw her face in front of him, remembered how they had walked together, from the time he was cursed until now, he has avoided people. Therefore, it may be difficult for him to realize his true feelings. The butler observed the young man's condition with an attentive and concerned eye. I wish he were happy. You must find out for yourself what's on your mind, he said to the duke. What is it? asked the duke again. He had heard nothing. He was in himself. The priest has arrived at the manor, said the butler. Go and see for yourself, and continued kindly. Don't think about anything but your feelings, and went quietly to the door. My feelings? said the duke confusedly. He pictured the girl's face before him at breakfast, her words, not jealous? 
Jealousy is something you feel only when you have someone in your heart. It's not for me. I just can't love anyone, Aslahan thought. He remembered the curse that had been placed upon him. The scary black and red wizard. How scary it was when he cast his spell. I'll show you stripped flesh. The stench of rotting corpses will fill your room. He remembered the bloody dagger before his eyes. The fear, the boy's tears. Memories flooded back to him. There was no one in my heart after that, he thought. Nobody, he repeated and left his room. He walked down the corridor and looked into Lariat's chambers. A couple embracing appeared before his eyes. Everything inside Aslahan exploded. He ran to the young men and grabbed the priest's hand. He pierced him with his gaze. Sparks flew from Duke Candel in all directions. His eyes were bloodshot with rage. A servant of Altion greets your lordship, the priest said in a calm, even voice. Oh, two handsome men beside me, thought the girl. I was right to wear glasses. No good will come of revealing my identity, said the priest. To reassure the duke, he raised both hands in a gesture of surrender. The girl watched in silent dismay. What will happen now? Scared, Re, the priest embraced her. The girl looked at the duke with wide, frightened eyes. She was trembling with emotion, surprise, fear, surprise. It's all right, Aslahan. He just treats me like a friend. That's what we used to do. Rhea just being friendly, the duke shouted, looking at the priest's arm around Lariat. How is he just a friend to her? I can't calm my thoughts, my brain, my indignation. And at the same time, the priest stroked the girl's head. Priest! Aslahan said stiffly and unyieldingly, standing like a monument with his legs spread wide. He was very tense. I obey your lordship, the priest replied calmly, bowing and leaving the castle. Hmm. Wasn't the duke heartless? He thought as he entered. This time, the duke stood in front of the girl and looked at him with frightened eyes. His gaze was cold and unyielding. Interesting, the priest thought, holding up his glasses with two fingers. But I won't give up either. There was complete silence in the girl's bedroom as Aslahan and Lariette sat side by side, their hands folded in their laps. She was embarrassed. He was exhausted and confused by his bursting emotions. You said you weren't jealous, the girl asked, squirming slightly. I reacted so emotionally. Am I really jealous? A thought raced through the Duke's mind. The girl took his face in her palms, leaned towards him, and looked into his eyes. Don't worry about others. Think about what you want for yourself. Yes, but I should think that your caress would be given to someone else. He remembered how the girl had touched him boldly, how they had gone to the show, how she had held his hand and pulled him away, saying, Don't worry, when I think of all this, I boil. I don't want you to hate me. I don't want to hurt you, the girl thought. I realize that I want you to be mine. I pushed the thought away and ignored my feelings. I resisted, but they looked at each other. How are we supposed to be Aslahan? The girl nervously rubbed her skirt with her fingers. Can I have a drink with Doha? The Duke was at a loss for an answer. Then he pulled himself together and said, Don't do it. Don't go, Lariat. Lariat, I'll do it. Lariat and Duke Candle were alone in the girl's chambers. They tried to make sense of what had happened, their feelings, their emotions, and their relationship. It was the first time I'd ever felt my heart beating so fast, the Duke said. My gaze is constantly drawn to you. I think about you endlessly without wanting to admit it. As soon as I imagine you with someone else, my blood boils. I want to cut off the hand that touched you. The girl looked at him as if hypnotized, listening to his every word. Aslan, she said with a heartfelt voice. If this is jealousy, then I am damn jealous, the Duke continued. But what am I? I am a dirty monster. I am afraid to even touch you, afraid to hurt you, to arouse disgust, unpleasant feelings. He clenched his fingers into a fist, trying to control himself and the feeling of his so disturbing peculiarity. He was silent for a moment and then spoke again. This feeling is unfamiliar to me, so I hesitated for a long time. Is your offer still on the table? The atmosphere was so tense that you could hear their hearts pounding. I like you, Lariat. The girl listened with her eyes wide open. She was afraid to interrupt. She wanted him to say everything he really felt. When she heard his question, she smiled happily. Of course, of course, Aslahan. She rushed to the Duke. I wrapped my arms around him, pressed myself against him, and buried my face in his chest. The Duke also put his arms around her and held her close. They sat like this for a long, long time, enjoying their new feelings. Their hearts beat in unison. Take care of me from now on, Aslahan. And you too, Lariat, he replied, and blushed deeply. Aslahan thought about what had happened. This is the first time this has happened to me. A situation where I would give love and receive it in return. I couldn't even believe that something like this could ever happen to me. Meanwhile, Lariat thought, I'll have a good three months and then I can die. Each of them thought of something else. The Duke of Candel thought about the garden again. After all, who knows, maybe Lariat will live in this house all her life. 
The next day, the girl made new entries in her diary to see a show, reading together in the library, going swimming, going to the hot springs. What is this? Aslahan was surprised when Lariat suggested he look at the entries in the notebook. That's all we need to do now. What do you think? The girl asked him. There's a lot that can't be done because of the curse on the body. Aslahan turned the pages. Is there anything else here? The girl almost snatched the notebook, but then she simply held the pages of the diary so that he couldn't leaf through them any further. There's something else in there already. She didn't let him see what was next. She was so scared because he'd almost discovered her death wish list. And they'd just started dating. I don't want to reveal that I don't have long, she thought. Good your case. Aslahan looked at the entry on the opened page. It said, inspection of the city completed. Everything flashed in his mind. I see you had a lot of fun. He imagined Lariette and the priest having a wonderful time walking around the city. Ah, uh, no. This is just a list of things I wanted to do. It doesn't have to be with a lover, the girl reassured him, seeing the young man's frown. Then he parried. You don't have to do it with me specifically. Lariette snorted. She loved to see the Duke's uninhibited emotions. Oh, excuse me, you're so cutely jealous. Hmm, cute, the Duke was confused. I only want to do it with my lover, the girl thought dreamily and said. And you do not want? Well, I will order the carriage to be prepared, he said. The girl excitedly put both her arms around his neck and shoulders. How much I like you, she exclaimed happily. The Duke blushed again. The couple went for a walk downtown. Isn't he cute? The girl smiled happily. The carriage stopped near the best boutique in the kingdom. He even remembered my words about the lack of something dressy in my wardrobe and brought me here. Of course, these are expensive clothes and jewelry that I would never have the courage to buy myself, she thought, as she looked at and tried on the outfits offered by the boutique staff. After a while, she emerged from the fitting room like a fairy, wearing a stunning blue dress with jewels and lace trim. Aslahan was literally speechless at the sight of such beauty. Everyone present was delighted with Lariette's appearance. But the girl kept trying on dresses. Which dress is more beautiful, this one or the cream one? She consulted Aslahan. You don't have to choose. I will buy everything you like and accessories you like too, he replied. The couple returned home with the gifts Aslahan had given the girl. We bought everything. The girl assessed the result of the visit to the boutique, looking around the carriage filled with parcels, boxes, and bags. Hey, listen, Aslakan, why didn't you answer me? She suddenly asked capriciously. What answer do you mean? The Duke was surprised. Frowning, the girl poked him in the chest with her finger. I was talking about the fitting of the dress when I asked if I was beautiful. Beautiful, so beautiful that I even forgot how to react. You answered too late. That's insulting. If something is beautiful, you should talk about it in time. She kept poking his chest with her finger. Don't poke him like that. Don't get angry. He grabbed her wrists and bent over her. You're beautiful, really. That's where the R rating would be good. But it wasn't. You're beautiful, really. Really? Lariette looked at him and covered her eyes slightly. Then kiss me. She looked languidly at the Duke and opened her mouth slightly. The young men approached. Their hearts beat so loudly that it seemed to be heard throughout the neighborhood. When we left Aslakan and Lariette, they were alone. And they were closer than ever, heated with emotion, feeling, passion. Just a little more, and they were ready to merge in a kiss. Arrived, Erchi. Um, um, shall I take your luggage? What is this? Aslahan jumped. It was the coachman. Aslahan ran from the carriage. The girl was indignant and ready to kill anyone who stood in the way of their meeting. A few days later, Lariette was in one of the halls of the castle. She was smartly dressed, her hair beautifully done, her hands modestly folded at the hem of her skirt. The girl was thinking about the fact that their relationship had not developed at all since Aslakan's escape from the carriage. She reflected on the fact that there were no fundamental differences from the time when they had not yet met. Nothing had happened at all. In the evening, our heroes met for dinner. Aslakan helped the girl pull up a chair, and she sat down at the table. I have very little time left, thought the girl, referring to the time the doctors had given her. He what? Does he think I can afford to wait? She could barely contain her emotions. Aslahan sat down at the table. The girl coquettishly put her finger to her mouth, looked into his eyes, and said, I want you to feed me. Today I am in the mood to feel the manifestation of my lover's feelings. Eslehan thought, hmm, her hands are fine, so why feed her? But he picked up the fork. All right, as you say, it is not difficult for me at all. Here, please eat, he began to woo Lariette. The girl opened her mouth and took a leaf of salad with her lips. Uh, um... The Duke looked at her with some surprise. It was not clear to him why these manipulations were necessary. She, on the other hand, felt completely satisfied. Eslehan, you are so sweet. The girl put her two arms around his neck, narrowed her eyes, and smiled happily. You are the best, Aslahan. She clung to him even tighter. The Duke's heart beat faster and faster. I have some documents that need to be dealt with very urgently. He couldn't stand the pressure. I'll go, he said, and got up from the table. If you'll excuse me.
Lariat's eyes widened so much that they almost popped out of their sockets. I need to get to the documents right away. What the hell is this? She jumped up and tried to stop him, but the Duke hurried away. The girl looked at him indignantly. The butler was also surprised. Was he serious? I knew it. Lariat thought about Aslahan's obvious desire for platonic love. She was so angry, so angry. She was pounding her fists on the table, angry. Oh, my blue dream is gone. Okay, that's not right. So I'm going to do an experiment. She's up to it. A few days later, the door creaked open. A girl's head peeked into Aslahan's office. I've come to clean you. Even though I don't have much time left, she continued. If he really hates being touched, I'll have to hold back, she decided. I don't even like him that much. What's there to worry about? The girl went over to the Duke and smiled. We'll do the upper body again today. Okay, Aslahan began to take off his outer clothes. Lariat stood and rejoiced softly. Here is my blue dream, blue dream, blue dream, blue dream. I am ready, Aslahan declared. His inflated body was very attractive. Broad shoulders, beautifully sculpted torso. The girl touched his shoulders, his chest. Energy and light flowed through her palm, her fingers. The girl leaned towards him. The patient's heart was beating loudly and frequently. To distract himself from what was happening, Aslahan spun various words in his head. Doc, purification, noun, the removal of dirt from something. Related words, to clean, to scrub, an establishment for cleaning. He thought about everything, everything but what was happening and the fact that the girl he loved was so close to him. Lariat sighed. Are you all right? Aslahan exclaimed. If you compare it to the vulgar time, yes, the girl replied. She almost fell on him. I feel so dizzy. Perhaps you could hold me. The girl looked at him cunningly, full of hope and expectation, and moved even closer to him. Lariat, he said. But she did not hear him. She reached out to him with her whole body and her lips. At this time, Aslahan kept saying to himself, I'm trying, holding back. Ia, I am trying. I'm holding back. We better keep our distance, Aslahan said, averting his eyes. He held the girl's shoulders. I can't estimate how much my restraint will be enough, he thought. But Lariat was unyielding. She held him tightly by his exposed forearms. Her heart was beating. The girl announced, You must not hold back. Do as you wish. Blood rushed to Aslahan's head. He pushed her onto the sofa and stood over her. Did you say to do as I wish? Can I really do as I please? He spoke confidently, looking her straight in the eye. But I was expecting something like a kiss, she said, confused. Now I feel like I'm being torn apart. 47. Her hair was scattered on the sofa. Aslahan leaned over her leaning on his arms and straddling her with his thighs. In front of the girl's eyes was his beautiful, powerful torso. Suddenly, he took her hand and kissed it. Yes, I will tear her apart and leave no peace, he said, and took her in his arms. Aslahan. The girl tried to do something, but he would not stop. Stop! I made a mistake, the girl begged. He was just breathing heavily, but he still managed to control himself. Then he lifted the girl a little and sat her down beside him. What are we going to do now? Lariette was frightened and upset. I won't jump on you like that again, she said. And next time I might not stop, he said sternly. Remember that well. Yes, yes, I'll remember that for sure. I'm sorry I scared you. Go back to your room. And I thought to myself, I should still be careful about touching. When the Duke came to dinner, he saw cocktails and fruit on the table. The girl was dressed in a bright red dress with lace and a tight corset, which made her very desirable and sexy. Flamboyantly attractive, she approached Aslahan. Then she leaned towards him, all bent up, very close her breasts heaving in front of his eyes. Shall we continue where we left off last time? I underestimated Lariat, the Duke thought. The girl leaned even closer and pressed her lips to his. And what happened next, you will learn in the next chapter. The story begins one morning, a few days after a cleansing session. Lariat wanted to go on a date to the town bar. Look at my plan, she showed the Duke, but was refused, which made the girl very sad. Even going to the bar is difficult for me, he explained. I don't want curses or curious or hateful or even squeamish looks at me like I'm a monster. Sorry. Yes, the monster duke's mistress has to give up a lot, he thought regretfully about such a fate for Lariat. I'm sorry, I can't give her what she wants, but I can't let her go, and I'm not going to let her go anyway. Oh, no, Lariat reassured him. Lovers should adapt to each other and take care of each other. What a nice girl, don't you think, spectator? Yes, and the place is not so important, she continued. The important thing is that we are together, isn't it? She reasoned with a thumbs up. Really? Aslahan looked hopefully into the girl's eyes. Oh, didn't you say you had to go to the Imperial Palace? Hurry up. You'll be so late. She pushed him towards the door. I'll see you tonight. All right, I'll be back soon. The Duke was pleased with this glorious resolution of an already brewing conflict. And also how reasonable, sensible, cooperative, and compliant his beloved was. As he left, Aslahan looked back at the girl. 
He was in a good mood. I will try to finish my business quickly and come back, he thought. We will have dinner together and then sit in the living room and have a drink and talk. He pictured her in that irresistible red dress with the corset that accentuated her figure. She would be sitting beside him. I'll ask how the day went without me. If she's settling in, what kind of alcohol she likes, what she likes to snack on, what he was going to do. But the meeting dragged on because of some nonsense. How much longer are you going to continue this useless argument? He tried to end the fruitless meeting as soon as possible. There was silence in the room. How dare you say such a thing to his majesty, exploded one of the participants in the meeting. The duke looked at him and recognized him. It was Father Lariat. He's a complete wretch, he thought. But he is also the parent of my beloved. So I think I'll turn a blind eye. Duke Candle is right, said the emperor. Let's not summarize yet and call it a day. Everyone got up noisily and began to disperse. Duke Blanche was indignant at Duke Candle's behavior. What an impertinent young man. Count yourself lucky, his majesty said suddenly. Duke Candel is so wild. Why did you get him? Isn't it impertinent for such a boy to behave as he pleases? Duke Blanche tried to prove his point. If you want to save a family that is falling apart, you must behave wisely, his majesty explained. Duke Blanche erupted with anger at Duke Candel and with indignation that he had been reprimanded in the presence of bystanders who were now gloating as they watched the scene. He jumped to his feet and stormed for the exit. It was all because of Lariat. May. No longer a child to take care of the family's affairs. The money keeps slipping through my fingers. The wife accuses the Duke of leaving Lariette. The family is in an uproar. Although she herself did not give her a proper education, he continued. Rayon is unwise with his money. I've been working to get Rayon a job in the Imperial Palace. So the financial loss has become a little less. But a child who dares to oppose her father is outrageous and unacceptable, he thought. All will be well if the girl comes back. He thought how good it would be if she came back soon, repentant, ready to be the same old working and unrequited lariat again. The Duke of Blanche imagined his daughter falling on her knees and tearfully begging him to forgive her. Well, I will, so be it. Show mercy and welcome her back into the house, the family. Is there anywhere else such a wonderful father as I am? He finished his thoughts proudly, and she dared to leave. He clicked his tongue. Late evening, lariat heard a noise in the corridor and ran out to see what was going on. The Duke must have returned, but she didn't see him. But the butler was already setting the table. Where is Aslahan? He wasn't at the front door, the butler reassured her. The Duke was worried that you wouldn't have to wait for him, so he went straight to change. I see, Lariat reassured her, and she thought she had almost been caught running through the castle, gasping for breath, to meet Aslahan as soon as possible. You ran, Duke Candel, who had entered the refectory, asked her. She gave herself away, she thought. When did you come? She asked. Just now, the Duke replied. You shouldn't have tried so hard to meet me. The girl raised her face, looked carefully into his eyes, and thought, he must have a lot of experience in relationships. I wonder how many girls he's been out with, more than a dozen girls? Of course, how can I be his first girlfriend when he has such a body and face? She melted as she remembered such beautiful features of the Duke and began to be jealous of the unknown beauties he had conquered. I wonder what she thinks. She always has such different facial expressions, Aslahan thought. The butler came into the room, started to mix cocktails, brought fruit, and soothed the tension that reigned in the couple. The girl clapped her hands, rewarding the butler with praise for his skill. You can do it too. Yes, I'm a butler. I should be able to do it, the butler replied. He set the table with all that was necessary for the couple and went away. As he closed the door, he wished them that this night would be historic for them. The couple sat on the sofa with cocktail glasses in their hands. Let's have a drink, the girl suggested. Let's have a drink, Aslahan agreed. It's enough that we're together, he thought. Just to be near her is happiness. The girl drank her glass in one gulp. Aren't you drinking too much and too fast, the Duke asked. I have a pretty good tolerance for alcohol, the girl replied. So good that I relax with it before I leave home. Huh. Oh yeah? How does it taste, he asked. Very sweet and spicy, the girl replied. And before you came back, I went for a walk in the garden. The well where you and I fell last time no longer flows. It's a pity. They looked at each other and both blushed. As for Doha, he's really my friend, she said. The Duke looked at her. Yes, yes, he even helped us with our relationship. Can we continue the treatment with him? She asked Aslahan. Doha is the best healer I know. I can only ask him to change the position that made you so confused and angry. What treatment she's getting, Aslahan thought and so careful to hide it, she even articulates it vaguely. But if it's for her health, I don't want her to hate me, 
do as you wish, he said aloud. You are so kind, the girl rejoiced, and looked at him unmistakably. And leaning against him, she laid her head on the duke's shoulder. I'm a little hot, she said, and pulled back the lace of her corset a little on her breasts. It's hot. Then she tried to undo the corset, but the wine had played its part, and her fingers would not obey. Oh, the clothes won't come off. What's the matter? She began to pull the bodice of her dress in all directions. The duke intercepted her hand and blushed both from surprise at her behavior and the awkwardness of the whole situation. She, on the other hand, took his hand, drew it to her breast, and placed it on her tender, half-naked body. The duke flinched and blushed even more. A shiver ran through his body. I'm sorry. Then undress me you, I beg you, the girl flashed her eyes at him. In the last chapter, we discussed the fact that the girl was trying to attract the duke to touch her body and was determined to finish what she had started and not finished earlier. Lariat? Oh, you're drunk, said the duke, and snatched his hand from her palms. But the girl pushed him so hard that he fell on the sofa. She hovered over him, bringing her face close to his. Aslahan, she called invitingly. You can't. I must control myself. You can't. Lariat is drunk. The young duke talked himself into it, trying hard not to succumb to her alcohol-induced recklessness. The girl put her hand on his breast. Pull yourself together. You can't. Lariat is drunk. The duke tensed, the blood rushing to his head. Lariat, go away, he asked and demanded, squirming and blushing. Well then, the girl said condescendingly. You'll have to fulfill a small request of mine, she said playfully, practically lying on top of him. What is your request? The duke tried to pull away from her. The thought kept going through his mind. Think only good thoughts. Think only good thoughts. Smack, said the girl and smiled. She sat on him, practically riding him. Lariette is drunk. Drunk, he repeated, telling himself. What is your wish? He asked again. Could I just have a smack and that's it? Just that, she asked the duke. Kiss me. Okay, the duke surrendered, but promise it's just that. Lariette touched him with her lips, but the duke touched his lips to her cheek. Had he had enough? Is he joking or something? A peck on the cheek? Lariette was categorically disappointed, and she wasn't going to let it go. She grabbed the Duke's face and tried to kiss him on the lips. Wait, Lariette. She tried to prevent him from getting so close, but the girl did not stop. She pressed her lips to his. The Duke gave in to passion and emotion. The sounds of kissing filled the air. Now that's what I call a slap. Lariette was proud of herself. Yes, that's a good one, said the Duke. He dodged, and now Lariette was lying on the sofa. The duke lay on top of her and held her wrists. Still, it had to be done right, as agreed. He hovered over her, holding her hands. The girl lay in his strong arms, sniffling softly. The duke released her and sat down beside her. He was devastated, exhausted, and depressed. Morning of the next day. The door to Aslakan's office swung open loudly. Lariette burst into the room with her arms wide open. She was happy, her eyes sparkling. Aslakan, she exclaimed happily. Are you awake? Aslakan sat at the table with his head bowed. Doesn't he remember? The girl looked at him in confusion. When did I fall asleep? I remember everything up to the moment you allowed me and Doa to be treated, said the girl. He must be so ashamed that he pretends he doesn't remember anything, she thought. The Duke looked at her silently. No, he doesn't remember, she concluded. I really do tolerate alcohol well, but the cocktails must have made me more than a little drunk. Stole my first kiss, and she doesn't even remember it. The Duke looked at her sadly. From now on, you are forbidden to drink with other people, he said. What? Why? Other people say I'm fine when I'm drunk. Other people, huh? The Duke began to boil. I wonder. Who is she drinking with? An ex-boyfriend, he thought. What about you? He's been with tons of girls himself. That's not fair. Lariat was angry in her heart. There was a knock at the study door. On the threshold was the butler. He smiled good-naturedly. I beg your pardon, my lady. The priest is here. Terribly bad timing, Lariat thought. The Duke clenched his fists. He was angry. But he ordered... Escort him to the drawing room. Huh. I don't know anything, Lariat thought. Doha sat on the sofa in the living room and waited for the girl. Re, the priest, greeted the girl as she entered. It's been a long time. Lariat came closer to him. I'm sorry about last time, she asked. I couldn't stop you when you were being chased away. You should have apologized earlier. The girl turned to the priest. What is there to apologize for? You have nothing to apologize for. The girl sat down next to him. Doha put his hand on her head. If you really feel guilty, come to me yourself next time. Speaking of treatment, can we change positions? The girl asked. Did your lover tell you to do that? Clarified the Duke. It bothers me myself. I have a boyfriend, so it's a little awkward. Hmm, how unpleasant to hear that, thought the priest. Fine, he said, although it might reduce the effectiveness of the treatment a bit, and smiled mischievously. 
Thank you, Doha. The priest put his hand on her arm. But think also of your friend, blinded by love. You won't forget our friendship, will you? He squeezed the palm of her hand. No, I'm sorry to have upset you, Doha, she cried, looking into his eyes sympathetically. I didn't mean it at all. Will you go out with me then, to the library, for example, he asked. Today? Lariette interjected. Yes, now it's not forbidden, is it? Doha clarified. Well, going to the library with a friend is normal. The girl nodded. Come on, Aslahan seems to be busy today anyway. The priest had noticed the servants watching them a little earlier. He figured the servants would stop watching them when they left the manor. If the duke is so concerned about honor, but he won't be able to follow his girlfriend and the priest into the library. Then I will come with you, they heard a voice and turned around. The duke entered the living room. No problems? Hmm, the priest just looked at the duke in silence. To say that priest and Lariette were stunned by the duke's sudden appearance is to say nothing. Doha rose and bowed humbly to the duke. The servant of Altion greets your grace, he addressed Aslahan. But Aslahan ignored the priest, looking over his head. Aren't you busy with your work? The girl was surprised and felt guilty. Huh, it seems that being near you is a more urgent task for me, said the duke. The girl blushed, embarrassed, looked into his eyes. She felt very uncomfortable. So can we go together? asked the duke. The priest clenched his fists. Yes, I didn't expect the duke to go far, he thought, and said aloud, of course, I would be honored. Have the carriage prepared, the duke ordered the butler, again ignoring the priest. Yes, the butler bowed and thought to himself, yes, well done, sir. A carriage rolled up to Duke Candle's estate. Two young men and a girl entered the library. There was an awkward silence in the carriage. It would be great if my friend and my boyfriend got to know each other, Lariat dreamed. We could have so much fun together. She smiled. Doa thought, I was beginning to think that I had gone on this adventure for nothing. I shouldn't have gone. And then I thought, I wonder if this feeling of fear is a prophecy. The carriage rattled on the pavement. Are we going to the Imperial Library now? Asked the priest. That's right, replied Duke Candle. The priest became excited. There are many people who know me. There will be trouble if my identity is revealed, he thought. Oh, what can I do? Doha worried, trying to find a way out of the situation. I completely forgot that I have business at the temple. I'm afraid I have to go back, right now, to avoid a scandal. He's found a way out. Of course, go quickly. It's nothing supported his girlfriend, believing in the reality of the urgent affairs of a friend. Thank you, my lady, the priest thanked the girl. Your grace, I'll leave you first, he said, leaving the carriage. I apologize for the inconvenience, the priest bowed. The carriage moved on, so it turns out that the duke and I will have a rendezvous in the library today, the girl thought. It amused her. She was quite happy with this possibility. She took the duke's hand. The couple was left alone in the carriage. The girl was holding the young man's hand. The duke, on the other hand, was worried. What is she doing? I'm not an animal. I'm a human being. We are in the library. What could happen there? Such thoughts and questions gave him no peace. The carriage stopped and the young people went into the library building. You are not holding my hand too weakly, or you will let go by mistake, the girl teased the duke. At the same time, he thought, it is so small and delicate that it will break if I make any effort. That's the problem, the girl thought. It had been Doha's idea to go to the library, but there wasn't much to do now. What to do? Well, I'll have a look around first, she decided, and began to walk through the halls of the library, trying to understand how everything was organized and what they could do here. The duke humbly followed her. Lariat laughed. He follows me around so nicely. She couldn't help herself and snorted loudly, then turned resolutely to the duke and drew him to her. Stop following me, she said softly in his ear, putting her arms around his neck. You'd better find a book to read. Aslahan blushed. Did you have to say it like that? He asked. We are in the library, Lariat laughed. Come on, choose a book, she jokingly pushed the duke towards the shelves. Okay, he replied. And they went their separate ways. Libraries have their own romance, Lariat thought. She imagined reaching for a book high up on a shelf, unable to reach it. And then the duke would come to her rescue. How their hands, reaching for the book, almost touch. And they're so close. And it's so exciting. And suddenly the duke puts his arm around the girl's waist and presses her passionately against him. And everything in her is shaking. The girl very much liked this course of supposed events. And she immediately proceeded to realize it. She went to the shelf and began to deliberately reach for the book, which was so high that she knew she could not reach it. She expected Aslakan to see her and rush to her aid. She waited and waited for the duke to do so. Would you like this book, lady? She heard and looked around. An unknown young man stood in front of her. The girl was very upset. Who the hell is this freak? How dare he invade her dreams and ruin everything? Get out of here. Get out now. What are you doing here? She gave him a stern look. The stranger was indignant. I wanted to help you and you didn't even thank me, he said. 
and went away, puffing indignantly. The girl's face was scornful. She thought, from whom, from whom, but from you, I didn't need any help at all. She resumed her dastardly plan. Again, she reached for the book on the top shelf. And then, oh joy, at last. Next to her hand, she saw a hand in a familiar black glove. Duke Candle helped the girl retrieve the much-needed volume. Well, at last, she sighed with relief. Did you see it? She looked back at the Duke. What exactly? He interjected. Why did you deliberately choose a book that was so high up? He grinned good-naturedly. Or do you mean the scene where you very rudely told the other man who helped you get it to go away? Lariette blushed. She was very embarrassed that all her tricks had been exposed. But I liked it very much, Aslahan went on, always behaving like that with other men. And he put his arm around her. Oh, said the girl with relief. And I was afraid that you would run away after discovering my deception, she said embarrassedly. It is I who should be worried that you won't run away, said the Duke. But if you do run away, I will find you. The young men stood hugging each other, excited, their hearts pounding with emotion. Of course I will not run away, Lariette replied. But it was a short-sighted answer. That library date with you was special, wasn't it? Lariat said. It really was special, the Duke agreed. When we get back, we'll have brownies, the girl suggested. With ice cream on top, right? Clarified the Duke. Yes, that's right, confirmed the girl. So, on a positive note, they returned home, talking cheerfully, finding complete mutual understanding in everything. They were easy and funny with each other, as if there had never been any misunderstanding or tension between them. Lariette! Suddenly someone called to the girl. The young people stopped and looked around. Who could it be? In front of them stood the girl's brother, Ron Blanche. How are you, little one? You're looking well, he said. And then he bowed politely to the Duke. Greetings, your grace, Duke Candle. Young Master Blanche, raise your head, the Duke said. Why is Ray in here? Lariette was confused and worried. What does he want with me? Maybe something has happened, she thought. Or maybe he's come to hurt me again, to humiliate me in some way. Or does he want to make me look bad in front of Aslahan? But I don't want him to know how my family treats me. I don't want pity. Anyway, her brother's appearance made her confused and uncomfortable, and she was terribly worried. Aslahan, you will return first, right? She asked. I'll talk to my brother and join you later. I can wait for you here, the Duke offered. But it might take a long time, the girl tried to dissuade him. All right, the Duke nodded as you wish. And he retired from the salon where they were at that time. Young Blanche crossed her arms on her breast and said mockingly, Ha! How can you live like this, flirting with that monster of a duke? The girl became angry. Be careful what you say, or you'll still be buried in the courtyard of the Imperial Palace, she said, looking unkindly at her brother. Look at her. You turned the house upside down, and now she's like this. It's because of you that mother is bedridden with illness. Her brother reproached her. Look at yourself. Your maximum is the life of a girl who crawls before the duke's monster. He continued to hurl accusations and insults. The girl began to tremble from such words and memories. You are a complete wretch and a disgrace to our family, Blanche. Rayon rebuked her. Could the Blanche family be more dishonored? Lariette parried. Rayon did not stop with accusations and mockery against Lariette. If you, with your very modest, magical talent, suddenly think you are capable of anything, you are sorely mistaken. So go on, pull yourself together and go home. It's the best option for a lowlife like you. We all didn't care if you left home. The girl straightened her back. Then, looking straight into his eyes, she said firmly, Take care of your family's affairs yourself, as you wish. These words made Rayon shake with anger. What, you? He couldn't find anything to say. His face fell and he slapped the girl as hard as he could. Lariat couldn't stay on her feet and fell. Rayon stood over her and laughed, enjoying her pain and humiliation. Rayon continued to scream at Blanche, spitting spit. Don't you dare try to be better than me. You are beneath me and don't try to crawl any higher. Oh my God, did he hit me? Lariat came to, lying on the floor. Did he hit me? She was shocked at what had happened. She was in pain and very hurt. He hit me? The one who forced me to leave home in the first place. And he dared to hit me. Her head was throbbing. The girl sat on the floor with her palm against the impact point and thought about what to do. Using magic inside the Imperial Palace will cause problems, she thought. And if we fight here, word will get out, which isn't good either. And then it will reach Aslahan but I don't want him to know that I was beaten in my family because it's shameful, she thought. Lariette stood up and staggered in front of her brother. I will end the line of this house, she said. What? roared Rayon, swinging to strike again. Lariette was angry and determined. She stepped toward him and kicked him hard in the groin. Rayon's eyes went black, his head crackled and flashed, and the image of a broken chicken egg appeared. It's nothing, said the girl and looked sternly at her brother. Rayon twisted so that he fell to his knees at the girl's feet, trembling, and rested his forehead on the ground. Covering her face with her palms, the girl walked away from the corridor. 
Broken, 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 she thought. In front of us is a labor exchange. There are lights in the windows. Lariette is in one of the rooms of the employment office. Hurry up and heal me, she asks the mage. I've been waiting a long time, more than two hours. The girl came here to get help to heal the place where she had been beaten, which was very painful, swollen, and purple-red in color. It was impossible to go to the duke's house like that. Let me have a look. The magician touched her face and turned her head. There's a crack in the bone here, she concluded, and started the healing process. After the treatment, the girl looked in the mirror. The impact point was throbbing, still visible, and it was as if it had only gotten worse. But that's the best I can do, the mage commented. You should have paid more for a high-level healer or priest, she said. The lowest level is that weak, Lariat thought with annoyance, holding up the mirror, and went back home. I have no money, so it will be difficult to continue the treatment. But I also can't show up like this in front of Aslakan. It's embarrassing. And we had agreed to eat brownies together, the girl remembered. What were we going to do? She stood in front of the Duke's mansion. There was light in the windows, but she did not know what to do. Suddenly, Lariat felt a hand on her shoulder. She turned to see Madame Charvet standing before her. My lady, what are you doing here alone at this hour? She asked. The girl didn't know what to say. Would you like to visit my boutique? Thanks to you, my clothes are selling very well, and I'd like to give you a gift. She took the girl firmly under her arm. Since we've met, take it now, the boutique owner continued. Okay, thank you, replied the girl. The ladies walked into the boutique together. Lariat sat before the mirror. Madame Chavre put a net headdress with pearls and ribbons on the girl's head. It's beautiful. How do you like it? It's a new product. It's very popular. And if we fix our hair a little, it will be even better, admired Madame the girl. While fixing the girl's hair, Madame continued to talk. In the course of developing my business, I have met many people, and everyone has their own story. There are customers who come to the shop after a hard day at work. And sometimes there are those who have been suffering all week. It sounds like you've had a very hard day today. But I want you to spend the end of the day without fear. And she put her arm around the girl's shoulders. And tomorrow will be a happy day, won't it? She smiled. Thank you, ma'am, Lariette replied. Don't mention it. We'll find out what happens next in the next chapter. We parted from our heroine while she was on the premises of Madame Charvet's bright, rich boutique. So you knew me before? She asked the owner of the boutique. Yes, but before I had few opportunities to meet you. But now at last I can say hello properly, replied Madame Charvet. The reason why Lariette and Madame Charvet had not yet met was that the latter was very close to the princess. The princess, for her part, had been seeing Rayan Blanche for some time and was even engaged, but the engagement was soon broken off. Why this happened, we can now understand ourselves without unnecessary explanations. As a relative of Rayan, Lariette could not get close to the princess and consequently to Madame Charvet. But now I am no longer Blanche. Call me Lariette, she said to Madame Charvet. Of course, she replied. And Lariette thought that because she had left this family, she had a friend today. It's a good thing I left, summarized the girl. In the mansion of Duke Candela's estate, the lights were on. Lady Lariette, are you all right? Screamed the butler when he saw her at the door. He was very agitated, worried, anxious, and all, as if he had been huffing and puffing. It was obvious that he had been searching for a long time and had looked everywhere. There was an uproar at the manor. Everyone was disturbed by Lariette's disappearance, and various steps and efforts were made to find her. Tell everyone to come back. My lady has returned home. Where have you been for so long? We were so worried, the girl shuddered. Ah, oh, well, she tried to explain, but couldn't find anything to say. Hmm, they're so happy to see me, Lariette wondered. There was a loud bang, a stomp. Uh, the butler said, looking around. Lariette shivered and tensed. A duke was approaching them at a run. He was very frightened and excited. He wanted to see Lariette immediately, to make sure she was all right to find out what had happened and where she had been for so long. Are you hurt? He asked, running up. The girl remembered Madame Charvet's words. Today has been a hard day, but I want you to finish it without fear. Forgive me. I'm very late, she took a step towards the Duke. Of course not, it's just that we haven't seen the family for a long time, so it took a while. I also decided to stop by the boutique. In the end, it was too late. The girl tried to smile and hide her fear and pain. I was worried looking into her eyes, replied the Duke. Then after he had calmed down, he smiled and said, well, in that case, let's go. He took her hand and pulled her gently behind him. The girl followed him. The movement swept the hair back from the face. The Duke stiffened, his face changed. Lariette, he shouted, what is this injury? Who dared to touch your face? He was furious and clenched his teeth. It's all gone, the girl thought. I couldn't find any trace of the beating. Frustrated, she looked at the Duke. Who? Once again, the Duke sternly demanded an answer. Thoughts raced through Lariette's head. She searched for the best way out of the situation. 
Should I deny everything or say that I fell? The Duke didn't give her a chance to lie. It's a bruise, he said. Someone made a fist, not even a quarter of a day later. And you've also received a paltry amount of medical attention from a low-level healer. How did he find out, Lariat wondered. The Duke shook with anger. I've seen a lot of injuries like this, so I'm well-versed. Lariat trembled. She remembered the situation with the Marquis de Segreve and asked, If you find out who did it, will you kill him? Would I do away with him so easily? Said Duke Kendall, and thought for a moment. The girl grabbed his arm. Aslahan, I'm sorry for worrying you. I'll take care of this myself. I'm strong. This is my problem, and I'm sorry to waste what little time I have left on it, she thought. Understood, Aslahan said. He was unexpectedly cooperative. Well then, I will summon a priest to see that you receive proper treatment. Good, rejoiced the girl. That it was concluded like that, and she flashed her eyes. But the Duke was only reassuring the girl. He had something else in mind. Duke Candell stood at the window and looked out into the darkness of the night. Gerard, he called. Yes, sir. A man immediately appeared in the study and knelt down. It was the commander of La Noche's shadow squad. Find out, the Count said, looking over his shoulder. Check, the man replied briefly. Looking at his reflection in the window, the Duke said, I must find out who attacked Lariette. What happened after I left? What happened to the Blanche family? I must find out all this. I hope I'm worrying in vain, he concluded. And now we move to the assembly hall of the Temple of Alteon. This is the most important gathering of the year. It can only be attended by high-ranking clerics and the high priest. Michael Dochevelian sat at the head of the table. Boring, he thought. Mr. Michael, there's a conversation going on, his assistant and junior priest Joshua called to him. We have met him before. Can't you see we're in a meeting? One of the senior temple priests sharply rebuked him, pounding his fist on the table, and continued to transmit. Michael... No matter how successful you are in the role of future pope, is it possible not to control your subordinates and allow them to be so careless? I guess you're right. Apparently I'll have to control my subordinates better, judging by the fact that you're bossing me around, the priest replied with a slight grin. But the man continued. I came to this temple before you were born, he exclaimed. He shook with indignation. I wonder when age became important in the temple, replied Michael Dushevelian, the high priest, with a grin. They all sat with their heads bowed. A frightened Joshua stomped toward the entrance of the room. Then he approached the high priest and whispered to him, A message has arrived from the Duchy of Candle. The purification mage is not well, so you are invited. The high priest rose from the table. Please excuse me, he said. And without wasting a moment, he walked briskly toward the exit of the temple, the door of which Joshua was already holding. Michael. The priest tried to call out to him, but in vain. He could hear nothing. He thought about his upcoming meeting with Lariette. After the high priest left the meeting, dissatisfied with Mikhail with the behavior of his assistant, the clergyman continued his indignation. But it is thought the main cause of his discontent was probably the rivalry for the papacy. He is a young and rebellious man. What kind of future pope is he? Future. He was supported by the members of the assembly, and he is of low birth. How does he dare to rely on the holy power alone? The others began to agree with him. Why did his holiness bring such a man? It would be wise for Gibralfaro to become pope, said one participant. Will you leave it at that? They murmured, turning to the clergyman who had introduced this subject of accusations against Michael. The latter was satisfied with the influence he had produced and with his success in raising doubts and discontent among the members of the assembly about the future pope. Meanwhile, Doha, in a remarkable mood, was on his way to meet Lariette. As he approached the mansion, he noticed that the girl was sitting in an open arbor in the garden. She was drinking coffee and was very happy to see the priest. Doha, she cried out. The young man was also very happy. He ran towards her lightly and cheerfully. Hello, Ree, he said, coming closer to her. Immediately, his mood changed. He saw the injury on the girl's face. What's that? He studied Lariette's face, trying to determine the extent of the injury. Whose work is this? He asked her sternly, his anger boiling over. Whose work is this? Doha persisted in his inquiries. He held Lariette's face and examined the blows. Who was it? He repeated. His eyes sparkled with indignation. Wasn't it the Duke of Candle? What are you thinking? It can't be. But yes, if it was him who beat you, then you simply would not survive. The priest agreed with Lariette's arguments. Who then? He continued to inquire. The girl turned her head away and lowered her eyes. Who could it be that is keeping her mouth shut, Doha thought. What kind of person could have insulted this girl, who is under the protection of the future Pope and Duke Candela of War Ghost? But the fact that she's keeping quiet only makes the situation more interesting, because I can find out for myself, the priest summarized although Duke Candle himself will probably take care of it to the fullest extent. So under the circumstances, it may not be my turn. Lariette looked at the priest from under her lowered lashes and confessed nothing. 
All right, my lady, just be careful not to get hurt, the priest asked. Thank you, Doha replied the girl. The priest thought, I need you because you are the only person who can treat me. We are the only ones who can heal each other. There will be problems if you get hurt or suddenly disappear, the girl invited, laughing to sit here. Doha sat down at the table and, pulling up a chair, said, Give me a wrist. The girl stretched out her hand. The priest took her hand and put a bracelet on it. This bracelet has a holy spell on it. It has a weak but healing effect. So don't take it off, the priest told the girl. A magic object, Lariat thought, but it's terribly expensive. It's a friendly gift for you, the priest replied. How can I wear something so precious? It's pathetic, the girl thought, looking at the bracelet glistening in the sun. Thank you, Doha. I'm sorry I didn't prepare anything for you. Lariat apologized, grateful for the gift and worried that she couldn't thank her friend enough for his generosity. Why are you apologizing? Just have fun with me some other time. That's good enough for me. You're just giving me the gift of your time. He replied slyly, squinting into her eyes. From time to time, this bracelet will check your health, he thought. And if it feels threatened, it will call me. So I spent you without telling you the whole truth. And therefore, you have nothing to apologize or thank me for. Everything around the young people was in bloom. They enjoyed the view around them and socialized with each other. But where was the lord of the manor at that time? Duke Candle was sitting in his study with a book in his hands. He was reading something in it, turning the pages, going back and reading again. Would you like to know what this book is? It's embossed in gold on the cover. How to have a great date. Yes, yes, yes. It was the same book that Aslakan was caught reading by the butler Halstein, but he refused to admit that he was interested in that very subject. The Duke read, tip number 21. To have an excellent date with her, you must regulate the pace of physical contact. If the pace is too fast, she will soon lose interest in you. Lose interest, the young man repeated to himself. And he imagined Lariat saying, you look like a monster. I don't like you. I've lost interest in you. Let's break up. He imagined her laughing cruelly at him. Who could love you? Who could love you like that? Who has become a monster? No, the Duke decided, I cannot allow it. I can't let her go. He was in deep distress. Whatever it takes, I must keep her. I will do anything to keep her from leaving me. Time passed. Aslahan sat in a chair, bare-chested. Lariat stood before him, bowing. She placed her hand on the heart chakra area of her patient. The area immediately lit up. It was the healing power of mana at work. It's a good thing we chose the office instead of the bed like last time. The girl thought about what might have happened and blushed. I'm not ready yet, she thought. The Duke felt her touch and was also thinking, but of his own thoughts. Be patient, he said to himself. I have to endure it and stay calm. That's it, I'm done, Lariat said. Are you all right? Asked the Duke thoughtfully. Yes, quite well, except for a little fatigue. The Duke put on his clothes and thought, it's greedy of me to hope to touch her with a body like mine. It's not only greedy, it's also overconfident and naive. She probably loses interest in me because of my slowness, but I can't touch her with such an ugly body. And maybe this is the only thing I can do to keep Lariat from leaving me. He tugged at the garment near his throat with his fingers, covering the ugly patches of damaged skin. What else could I do to keep her from leaving me? He channeled his thoughts in that direction. Let's cook something together, Lariat suddenly suggested. I wanted to try cooking with my friend, and I showed him a page from my diary. The diary said, cook together. Aslahan said too close and pulled the girl away. So you don't want to? Suddenly she took the Duke's hand with which he was pushing her away and kissed the palm. Well, what a thing. The Duke was so indignant that he did not know what to say. He was very embarrassed, blushed, and took his hand away from her. Why did he always have to hold back? You agree, don't you? The girl giggled. Yes, replied the Duke. The preparation of the kitchen for the fun cooking practice of the two lovers was completely finished. Of course, the butler Halstein had contributed his efforts. Put this on. The girl offered the Duke an apron. She imagined how handsome he would look in frills, bows, and ruffles. The Duke shivered. I don't think it's my size, he said. The girl hummed, imagining him even more colorful in an apron over his naked torso. That would be so cute. Well, okay, let's cook without it then, the girl allowed, throwing the apron aside. Woo! The Duke exhaled in relief. A short time later, Aslahan gathered his thoughts and made up his mind. I must tell her all this now. If I wait any longer, I won't be able to believe in myself. But how should I tell her? He thought about it. Do I say, my body is terrible, so I'm afraid to touch you? Or am I afraid that you'll lose interest in me, so let's slow down? Finally, having chosen his words, Duke Candell approached the girl and said, Lariat, how would you like us to slow down a bit? And immediately she blushed. It's ridiculous. I asked for no more excitement. That's just, well, inappropriate, he thought. All right, let's do it, the girl answered willingly. 
The Duke was satisfied with the quick resolution of such a sensitive yet important issue for him. Thank you for your understanding. Not at all, she reassured him, seeing how worried he was. But he was thinking of touching her, and the girl thought he was talking about cooking. Well, shall we start cooking? Our heroes get to work. The Duke took a very active part. The girl watched him with interest, as he skillfully whipped the cream, kneaded the dough. She herself prepared the crust for the cake. After throwing the cake into the pan, she ran around the kitchen trying to catch it, and was very happy when she succeeded. And they both breathed a sigh of relief. The Duke laughed heartily as he watched Lariat's skills. All in all, the two of them had a pleasant time together. Ta-da! The cake our couple had prepared was on the table. It was decorated with chocolate, cream, and fruit. Say am, suggested the girl, offering him chocolate-covered strawberries on a fork. Aslahan was surprised and did not react in time. A trace of chocolate remained on his lips. But then he ate the offered dessert. Lariette grabbed his chin. You're dirty, she said, and kissed him on the lips. Then our heroes decided to cook together. While tasting the cake they had prepared, Lariat once again attacked the Duke's sanctity, first by licking the chocolate from his lips, and then by kissing him on the lips. Aslahan was stunned by such a treacherous attack from a girl. After pulling himself together, he had asked her to take her time with the physical contact. She, on the other hand, was very pleased with herself. The last time we kissed was after we'd been drinking. The first time, it wasn't romantic at all. But for a second kiss, she said, there's no better time than now. Then she dipped a strawberry in chocolate and put it to her mouth, deliberately staining her lips. Now you can help me wipe it off too, she provoked the young man. The Duke was once again tensed by the situation Lariette kept creating, even though they had agreed not to rush things. But the girl did not give up and tried again to kiss him herself. The Duke stopped her abruptly, his fists clenched. No, but this is too much, he thought. So, our agreements are worthless, he asked. What do you mean, interjected the girl. Somehow she's not afraid of getting bored with me. And I'm afraid of that, and I don't know what to do. Apparently I couldn't convey to her the seriousness of my request. I think I am the only one who is afraid of what might happen if we hurry. What's the matter? Why are you so upset? The girl tried to comfort him by touching his arm. He flinched at her touch and clenched his fists. Then the Duke jumped up abruptly. He was tense as a cord. But controlling his emotions, he said, I will go to rest and retired. The girl was left alone in the salon. The next morning, Lariette was found with a book called How to Tame a Wild Animal. After tidying up with the utmost care, the girl decided that today it was absolutely necessary to solve everything. She didn't understand why he had begun to avoid her again. And she remembered what she had learned from the book, that a wild animal should not be frightened, but befriended. Lariette was ready for anything. The Duke was sitting at the table in the living room watching the news. There was a creaking sound. Magician, have you come? He called out. What? I'm a mage again. But why? Aslahan drank his coffee in silence. Are you angry? She asked. No, the Duke replied. Then why am I a magician? The Duke drank his coffee in silence. The girl was very upset, but when she looked at it, she remembered the kitten she was trying to tame and snorted. Sorry, it's just that you're so cute. You think a lot of people are cute? Aslahan pretended to read the newspaper. And he thought that acting like that because she ignored his request was probably not such a good decision. But isn't the biggest problem now that my mood improved immediately after she called me cute? He admitted to himself. Lariette, on the other hand, thought. He may cut people up, but he's such a good kitten. And she giggled. Aslahan, why don't you explain why you got angry? She asked him. Explain? The Duke thought. I look pathetic even to myself. How pathetic will I look in her eyes? If I'm honest, she might get disappointed and leave me. Besides, everyone loves Lariette, unlike me, the monster. Just because you look at me like this, I should be grateful to you all my life. I should kiss your feet, he thought. What will happen if I don't say anything? After all, I've already tried to explain everything several times. I thought you were very thoughtless about my request yesterday. A request? The girl was surprised. And she remembered the conversation in the kitchen. So he wasn't the one talking about cooking. She was surprised at her guess. I thought since it was your first time cooking, you shouldn't rush into it. So you talked about touching? You finally got him. I'm sorry, Lariat. I was being silly. The girl jumped up and came over to him. Utu, 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 utu. So our Aslahan was annoyed by the fast pace. She was teasing him. And where was the one who said, I may not stop next time? Who told me to memorize it well? The girl openly mocked him, provoked him. She hit him right in the heart, unable or unwilling to realize that his restraint was very difficult for him. But he suppressed all his impulses because he was protecting her. He could stand it no longer. Aslahan exploded. All of the young man's restraint and good intentions flew out the window. Emotions took over, and our heroine succeeded. The Duke left the room. If you don't want to miss my new videos, support the channel by subscribing and don't forget to like the video. Forget to like the video. Forget to like the video.